was going to show you. I got a great picture. Good morning. Welcome to the uh, August 2nd meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Could we start with a roll call? Commissioner Rotkin? Here. Commissioner Chase? Commissioner Bottorf? Here. Commission Alternate Johnson? Here. Commissioner Leopold? Here. Commissioner Friend? Commissioner Coonerty? Commissioner Caput? Here. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez? Present. Commissioner Johnson? Here. Commissioner Brown? Here. Commissioner Bertrand? Here. And Commissioner McClendon? Here. All right. Well, the first item is oral communication. This is a time to address the commission about items under the purview of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. We are going to be hearing presentations about both rail and trail today. So if we could keep the comments about those things during those periods, and keep the oral communications about things that aren't on today's agenda, that would be great. And because we have two presentations, I'm going to limit the oral communication to no more than a half hour. Is there anyone who would like to come forward? Good morning. Good morning. Clay Kemp, Executive Director of the Seniors Council in Area Agency on Aging. I have a handout for you. Not sure which way to send it. Some of you attended a solution summit uh, focusing on seniors and people with disabilities last November. And out of that summit, we created a number of work groups to address key issues facing that population. One of those work groups revolved around loneliness and isolation. And the reason I come here today is because transportation is a key element to combat that condition. And the handout I have is an infographic that the work group has put together regarding just some general information about loneliness and isolation. We will be coming back to the community with some specific actions and solutions, but right now this is just kind of an information um, item just to raise some awareness about this. I'm really happy to share with you also that the Commission has already contributed to countering this trend. And one of the things that is just getting started right now is the Loudon Nelson Senior Center, or the Loudon Nelson Center has a variety of senior programs and classes, and a number of the seniors attending those has identified transportation as their biggest barrier to getting to those classes. So Liftline and the City of Santa Cruz have worked together to use Measure D funds to provide seniors taking a class a free ride to attend those events. And we think participation and engagement is one of the most important things to counter the challenges that loneliness and isolation present and some of the facts and concerns that are in that fact sheet. So I'm just really happy to share that, you know, not only raising awareness about the issue, but um, announce that Measure D funds are being used effectively to counter some of that. And, you know, thank um, to all of you for that campaign and its success. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you for your support of Measure D. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed your hiatus for the last few weeks. Uh, Michael Saint uh, with the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. And uh, before each of these RTC meetings, uh, I go through a constant battle on what to say for this limited time of three minutes to try and help to move the needle away from uh, single car occupancy to mass transit. Um, today I'm not going to talk about SB this, AB that, or any of the numbers. We all know 
that the Oxlane projects are not going to solve our congestion problem and actually will also harm our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, primarily, if you believe that the thing I want to talk about is climate change and global warming, we seem to not touch on that too often anymore. Uh, if you believe in climate change, then we should do everything we can to mitigate this issue. Um, the first, uh, w behind what we are going to do is the RTC's decision is going to allow an increase uh, in gra greenhouse gas emissions and vehicle miles traveled with the Ox Lanes project. Or are you going to take the suggestions of some of the commissioners in the past few months, which have said we want to move people and not cars? It is about time we said no to the automobile. These are all your words. Um, and specifically, one member said, we know that this will not solve our congestion problem. Greenhouse gas emissions, as you know, are increasing on the transportation side of the equation. And it is almost up to 50% of our greenhouse gas commissions, <coughs> emissions in the tri-counties. Science is telling us what to do, and the government is not doing it. <coughs> California's greenhouse gas emissions and vehicle mile travel targets is not just a technical exercise. Air resource boards and RTCs need to become a national and global model for responsible planning and development if human civilization is to survive global warming. It is crucial that targets be adopted that lead to sufficient change to meet states' aggressive goals. Failure to do so is not an option. We have a very serious situation with the global warming, and it seems to be placed on the back burner, no pun intended. The reason it's placed there is because of voter mandates. Even if they're harmful, we follow those. EIR, EIRs are lowered to the level of community interests, not global interests. And measures are passed with the help of entities whose only goals are to improve their bottom line at the expense of the environment. So two questions for this RTC. Are you up to the task of making uncomfortable policy decisions and scary decisions for a public that does not like change? Are you willing to lead us to your, us and the community to a safer world and help us fight climate change? Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to address us during oral communication? Good morning, Mr. Hurst. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Lowell Hurst, Mayor of Watsonville. So I say welcome to Watsonville. I don't know who's going to give the traffic report today. I wasn't out there on the road. I was local. Hmm. But when I came through the garage, I saw a lot of cars in the garage today. A lot of people dro obviously drove here. But one person in the audience really exceeded uh, all expectations that I could uh, ever have. She actually rode her bicycle up the entire up the entire incline. And so that's Gina Cole back there. Uh, mm -hmm. So I say congratulations to Gina. <laughs> We're in a celebratory mood this morning. Good morning. Hi, my name is Peter Stanger. I also want to uh, congratulate all the commissioners and anybody here that uh, took uh, Metro or rode their bike in to Watsonville today. Uh, I did along Beach Street again. Beach Street has no bike lane. Beach Street has 40 miles an hour. Uh, also, the access into Watsonville along Freedom Boulevard has no bike lane. Yet, we're here uh, talking about, um, or we will be shortly talking about, how to parcel out money uh, that would could be used to make biking safer in Santa Cruz County. Um, I think it's a matter of trust. Um, back in January, one of the commissioners said, gee, maybe the public isn't trusting us. And I'd like to point back to that and say, yeah, that's true, because you wound up with two plans for segment 17 of the Monterey Bay Scenic Sanctuary Trail, and neither one of them, it looks like it's going to get funded until the uh, <coughs> train tracks are completed up in Santa Cruz. Uh, they built, you all built the, uh, La Sel rebuilt the La Selva Trestle with no bike lane. Uh, again, what are you thinking here? I mean, are the bikes going to just stay on San Andreas Road? Um, also, uh, you built the Yacht Harbor parking lot and bike lanes there uh, using Monterey Bay Scenic Sanctuary Trail funds. Uh, couldn't there be some money for South County, like 
Beach Street or uh, Freedom Boulevard. Um, I just don't know. I, I think it, there's a big effort here to depress the will of the people. I see um, that now your cronies uh, with Fort uh, want to depress the uh, citizens of Capitola from voting um, on what their feelings are about uh, a train running through their community. I would ask that this commission um, start listening more to the people and perhaps even put it on a ballot. Thank you. Gail, I just want to, I've asked people to sort of, we're going to do the trail and rail later on, so these are issues that we're not going to cover today. Okay. Um, I will not go into the rail and trail, and I would just like to say, um, you know, it's wonderful to see so many people here this morning um, working together, hoping for achievable solutions to our county's transportation crisis. Um, those of us who drove here from North County, um, at this time of day, I think maybe the worst of the traffic was over, so it was moving on the other side, um, but I imagine if we had come an hour earlier, we would have seen something different. So going back in this series um, to Jarrett Walker, who pointed out a few months ago that transportation equals opportunity and freedom, um, clearly we're here today with, with hope, um, and we do need to work on bringing more opportunity and freedom and equality to our county when it comes to transportation. Um, those traveling northbound from Watsonville each day obviously bear the brunt of our transportation crisis, so it's appropriate that we're here today for this meeting. And Greenway, um, we do, we want to reiterate the fact that we do support continued freight to Watsonville, but we also support keeping the door open to all of the options that we're currently studying in the Unified Corridor Study. We believe that these costly studies should have measurable outcomes, and we hope that this conversation today will be part of moving these outcomes forward. So thank you for doing this today. Um, I, we're looking forward to hearing the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address us? Seeing none, we will uh, move to see whether there's any additions or deletions uh, to the consent or regular agendas. Good morning, Mr. Dondero. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Um, we have uh, a few uh, additional pages. Um, I'll read them in order. Replacement page for item 5, replacement pages for item 12, um, add-on pages for item 12, um, Replacement page for item 14, uh, handout uh, for item 20, and handouts for items 22 and 23. And we have no other changes to the agenda. Okay. Thank you. Um, then next one, we move on to the consent agenda. Uh, this is, I'll, I'll see if any commissioners have any items in which they'd like to comment on or, um, or pull off the consent agenda. Seeing none, uh, uh, it would be an appropriate time for a motion. Move approval of the consent agenda. Did you want to ask the public if anybody had yeah. issues first? Uh, uh, thank you for reminding me. Second. Uh, uh, is there anyone from the public who would like to address items on consent? Then we will go, go back. There's a motion by Rockin, seconded by Bottorf. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next, we'll move into our regular agenda, which is uh, our commissioner reports. Are, are there commissioners who would like to, uh, to make a report? Uh, Mr. Bertrand, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, I'd um, like to report some actions that the City Council of Capitola uh, just completed on the 22nd, uh, written up by our legal staff. At the Capitola City Council meeting held on July 26, 2018, the City Council unanimously directed the Capitola City Attorney's Office to prepare a lawsuit called a RIP, Writ of Mandate, challenging the Greenway Initiative. The City of Capitola will be seeking a judicial declaration that the, le the measure is legally invalid and an order directing that it not be placed on the November ballot or, alternatively, that it be removed from the ballot depending on the date we're able to get it to set for a hearing. As it is a legal challenge to an election matter, we are legally entitled to an expedited hearing. 
but the court still has some direct discretion as to the hearing date. The three basic, ground, uh, basic grounds upon which we are basing the challenge are that it only directs administrative action and is not legislative in character, which is required for initiatives. Two, that it improperly attempts to impair with the city's legal authority over fiscal matters in the city. Three, and that it is couched in terms that are <laughs> impermissibly vague. That's it. Thank you for sharing that with us. Are there other commissioners who would like to make any comments? Seeing, oh, uh, Ms. kaufman go. Yes, morning. thank you. Um, we're, we're pleased to see that we are moving our freight. Uh, we have the Big Creek has moved all of their, their lumber from the Pajaro Yard and are now being able to um, get their product for their business, um, as well as a couple other vendors that we have in town that we've had, I've had some direct con conversations with. Um, and I will mention that we are looking to try and see what we can do about moving some of the freight that's in front of Walker. I think that there's some traffic um, area there that uh, it's, Im it's impeding the visibility of the traffic for that particular section. So I'm encouraging you to do what you have the capability, what, what you're capable of doing in terms of moving um, that section from where we're right on Walker Street here. So um, again, thanks for moving traffic. Our freight's working for us down in Watsonville. And uh, we just want to make sure that we have a clear corridor there. Thank you. Any other comments from commissioners? Seeing none, I'll move to our director's report. Uh, good morning, Mr. Dondero. Good morning, commissioners. Um, uh, a couple, few things to announce, but I just uh, in response to um, the last comment, uh, we did receive a copy of the filing with the STB, and it appears that Progressive Rail will be operating um, on the August 16th. So. Um, and they are uh, bringing their team to town next week, talking with many of the shippers. Um, I was copied on some emails this morning, so they're really doing their part to uh, get communication going with all the people that are going to be depending on the freight service. So that's good news. Um, as far as moving the tank cars that I think you're referring to, um, unfortunately, Iowa Pacific is still um, in control of those. and. Um, We've asked them to move them, but I don't think we've received any response. So probably we'll have to wait until Progressive gets on board uh, to move those. Um, so a few other items. Um, uh, oh, and also in response to the Capitola um, uh, statement that uh, Commissioner Bertrand just read, uh, we did send uh, a, a letter to City Council uh, yesterday uh, comment letter that's very consistent actually with the uh, content of your statement. So um, so we're looking forward to seeing the outcome of that. Um, so the North Coast Rail Trail Project, uh, at our last meeting we announced that uh, we were anticipating release of the draft EIR for this seven and a half mile uh, North Coast Trail Project. Um, our staff and our consultant team have been working on wrapping up a few elements of the analysis in this document and uh, the current uh, anticipated release date is sometime next week. Um, I still don't, can't give you an exact date, but we will send out a news release uh, when it's available and we'll also publish dates for the public meetings um, that will accompany that. Uh, it will be posted online. Hard copies will be available at our office as well as in major public libraries. Uh, during the 45-day uh, review period. Um, <coughs> next week, on August 9th, uh, at 11 a.m., a transportation agency from Monterey County will conduct a groundbreaking ceremony for their new uh, passenger station at the site of the current Amtrak station. Um, TAMC uh, will also be adding new layover tracks to accommodate the extension of commuter rail service from San Jose into Salinas. And as you all remember, um, that service um, will make a stop in Pajaro Junction, very close to where we're sitting today. Um, so it uh, will be available to citizens of this county. Of course, they'll have to get across the river and, and get over to that station. But uh, that's where our rail line connects with the Union Pacific main line. Um, and then we'd like to welcome a new staff member. Uh, Benjamin Wolf joined us in June um, as on a senior accounting position. 
Um, most recently, Ben served as the financial controller at Newman's Own Organics in Aptos for over four years. And prior to that, he was the chief financial officer at Network Management Solutions in Santa Cruz. He's also an active CPA with a focus on tax preparation and business consulting. Um, Ben's not here today, but uh, he's <coughs> working back at the office keeping, learning, learning the ropes with the books before Daniel leaves us. Um, ben comments that, uh, quote, I'm very excited to join the RTC. Having grown up in Santa Cruz, I've seen our town change so much over the years, with transportation being one of our primary community issues. I hope my finance and operations background can enhance the RTC's processes and reporting, enabling us to de efficiently deliver much needed transportation solutions to our county. Uh, ben graduated from Santa Cruz High, Cabrillo College, and Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. Uh, in his free time, he enjoys mountain biking and longboarding, in addition to spending quality time with family, friends, and his dog. So um, that concludes my report. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Are there questions for Mr. Dondero? Um, great to see a new staff member on board. That's obviously a critical position. Yes. Look forward to yes. meeting him. Uh, next, we'll move on uh, to item 21, which is our Caltrans report. Uh, uh, last month, we, uh, or last meeting, we didn't get to our Caltrans report, so I'm, I'm glad to, uh, to recognize our Caltrans representative. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. I do have a few announcements. First and foremost is dealing with safety, because obviously safety is our top priority, and it's our top priority for road repair and construction as well. Caltrans and its partners, such as RTC, are facilitating many road repair and construction projects statewide. In fact, it's a level of work that we haven't seen in decades. And the reason is because of funding from Senate Bill 1, which is the Road Repair and Accountability Act of 2017. A couple of local examples throughout Santa Cruz County for projects that will be funded through this, this, um, <coughs> this fund is, uh, for one, Highway 17, we're going to do a, a capital maintenance pavement project between uh, Santa's Village Road in Scotts Valley to the Santa Clara County line. So that'll be a total of 26 lane miles for a cost of around $19 million. And that'll also include uh, replacing the high friction safety surface that's north of, um, that's north of Laurel. Um, so that's, that's gonna be the first project that we see coming up and that's gonna be later this year in November of, um, or mid-November. Um, the second is Highway 1 near Davenport, a culvert replacement or a drainage project, and that'll be an $8.3 million project, which will replace and upgrade four existing culverts with uh, re reinforced concrete pipe. Uh, that w that, that's a little later, scheduled for fall of 2021. And then further down in uh, spring of 2022 is Highway 9, San Lorenzo River and Kings Creek bridge replacement project. That'll be a $23.2 million project that'll, that'll uh, construct needed uh, replacements for those bridges. My second announcement is um, a call for projects that is part of the local partnership formulaic program. That's cycle two of uh, the local partnership formulaic program. That's administered by the California Transportation Commission and uh, will total $200 million statewide in annual formula grants to reward counties, cities, districts, and regional transportation agencies that have voter approved fees or taxes solely dedicated to transportation improvements. And of course, this program will help address the state's highest transportation needs while fairly distributing the economic impacts uh, um, of increased funding. This is also funded, provided by Senate Bill 1, the Road Repair and Accountability Act. And so this is, the, the call for projects is for cycle two with applications due uh, August 29th. And as a refresher in cycle one, 
the RTC was uh, able to conduct a, a full, de uh, full depth recycle and overlay project throughout the county for around 500,000. And there were two vehicle replacement projects for Santa Cruz Metro um, that were, that were uh, 155,000 and 631,000. So those were where we're seeing some immediate dividends in our community here. Uh, thirdly here, an another thing, we talked a little bit about climate change and uh, another um, recent newsworthy item is the recent award of um, our, our um, low carbon transit operations program, which um, awarded 152 local projects statewide, totaling $97 million in funding for this program. And um, out of those 152 projects, more than 130 projects and 87 million were targeting disadvantaged and low-income communities. And of course, the, the general purpose of this program is to support reducing greenhouse gas emissions and improving public transportation sustainability. Um, let's see, I have... One of the projects that was awarded was awarded to the Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz Metro for a uh, Watsonville zero emission bus replacement. And that'll add an, another zero emission bus to the fleet. And that, wa that award was for $619,000. Finally, uh, another quick announcement about a project that we have coming up in Watsonville. It is a safety and a pedestrian improvement project, and that'll be on Beach and Marchant, right by the Watsonville High School. And that is very early in the project development. The details are still being um, worked on, but it'll essentially improve the pedestrian mobility with enhanced crosswalks, high visibility signage and, and uh, rapid flashing beacons on the signs that alert motorists that this is a pedestrian crossing area. That's being developed right now and is scheduled for construction in late 2019. That's my report and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, uh, I see uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Supervisor Caput has a question. Well, uh, you, thank you very much. Uh, the cooperation with uh, Caltrans has been uh, wonderful, and uh, I appreciate the communications and everything. Uh, that Marchant and uh, East Beach, uh, anyone uh, that knows that area well, that's at Watsonville High School, and it's uh, used by a lot of uh, students, uh, especially in the morning, in the afternoon when school gets out, and also during lunch. And... Uh, so it's, it's, it's going to be a wonderful project, and I appreciate that. Uh, the other one, it would be the, uh, uh, I guess, on Riverside Road, uh, Highway 129. That's pretty much completed now from the San Benito line to uh, Watsonville city limits. Yeah, they, they may be wrapping up a few things for construction, but it is basically completed. Okay. And there was a problem over the weekend with the uh, traffic lights, and uh, they've been fixed. Uh, there was a big backup uh, recently, so thank you for that, too. Uh, the other would be a, just maybe a quick report on what we're looking at is a crosswalk uh, also on 152 at uh, Lakeview, St. Francis High School, and the Valley Catholic Church, uh, some kind of... Uh, uh, enhanced crosswalk with lights, and if you can just maybe briefly uh, go over what we've been looking at. Uh. We, we've been talking about different crossing improvements for pedestrians there. That location hasn't triggered so far as, as a safety improvement project, but we are cons Caltrans is conceptually uh, in agreement with the county and that, that um, you know, improving pedestrian mobility 
is um, a possibility there, and we're willing to work with the county and Supervisor Caput on on looking at uh, potential encroachment or t a, a project through an encro uh, encroachment permit process. And uh, we'll be also talking with the mayor uh, and the city for their support maybe on that and also the one on Marchant. And, uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're both a big concern for uh, students uh, and why the city is involved with uh, Lakeview, even though it's out of the city limits. Uh, almost all the students that go there are from the city of Watson. They're, you know, walking mm -hmm. and crossing in that area. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Rockin. I, I just wanted to add a comment. I, I don't know if members of the public are aware of this, the more than $600,000 that's available for the zero emission bus in Watsonville pays for about half the cost of one bus. And even those of us that have been in public life for a long time are still shocked by these things, but people need to be aware of what it costs to have public transportation. That gives you some idea. When someone said, oh, $600,000 plus, we're going to have six new buses or something. No, it's half of the cost of one electric bus. Mr. Bertram. Yeah, um, thank you, Kelly, for answering an early question. Um, maybe the public would like to hear your answer. Uh, basically, a number of constituents have asked me about the debris from accidents on like 17 or Highway 1, and how do you go about um, taking care of that? And so you remarked to me that there's actually a website, uh, I guess, through Caltrans, and so I look forward to uh, hearing more about that, and um, it's nice to know that we have an option. Yeah, absolutely, and I don't have the exact address, but I, I think if you Google Caltrans customer service request, it takes you to the website, and it's a pretty straightforward form where you could enter in what the issue is and uh, as many details as you have about it, uh, uh, specifically as many location details that you have would help our, our maintenance crews in this case get out there and, and address the issue as quickly as possible. But um, I can get the exact website to you and um, that's kind of our interface for intaking those things such as, you know, with debris or if, if you know, um, vegetation control type of things is, is what that customer service request form is really good at handling. Thank you, Kelly. Oh. Are there any other questions? Ms. Kaufman Gomez. Yes, I'd like to know a little bit more about, um, since our main street is a Caltrans street or a road um, through Watsonville here, what you've got on the plate for any type of safety um, there. We, we do have on the city section some crosswalks we're putting in in terms of flashing lights, but we have a couple other significant crossings on our main street here, which are Caltrans, and would like to see what we can do about getting some work put on those, especially in light of some density um, construction for housing that's on our main street. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, we would be very happy to see something implemented and, and put into place for the crossing on, on our main street that's a Caltrans street. Thank you, and that actually um, brings to mind a couple of recent planning grant efforts that we've awarded to the city of Watsonville. Um, <coughs> in the past couple of pl uh, Caltrans planning grant cycles, we've awarded um, the city one study to look at the downtown area and to study main streets and complete streets types of improvements for that are specifically focused on uh, the downtown area, including Highway 152. And then the second study is looking at um, the, a similar idea, increasing uh, pedestrian bicycle mobility and in, improving those conditions there, specifically targeting uh, locations around schools. So it's a safe routes to school related project. And we, we can work together on, if you know, looking at specific questions because, uh, you know, we don't want um, if there's if there's specific questions or maybe some safety concerns that you're seeing, we want to look at those now. We don't have to see those play out in the planning effort. But I would encourage everybody interested, you know, the community residents and and Watsonville, the the Watsonville community, to participate with the city's planning effort. And those both efforts are. Um, 
planning to he heavily engage the public and get a lot of input and build their recommendations off of those. So I would just like to put a plug in for those two studies and, and they should be um, reaching out to everybody about different events and, and ways that people can um, engage with those studies. Okay. Any other uh, comments? Is there any comments from the public about the Caltrans report? Hi, Stanley Sokolow, Santa Cruz. Um, a few years ago, I rode my bike uh, from Santa Cruz to Costa Noa KOA campground on Highway 1 along the shoulder. And uh, on, on the route, I encountered a lot of patches of broken glass. And even though I'm alert to it, I accidentally punctured my, my tire on one where you couldn't see that the glass was there. Uh, so it, I wonder how often... Caltrans sweeps the shoulders of Highway 1 between Santa Cruz and going north. Thank you. I, I think what a good thing to do would be is we have our, our quarterly director's report, and I, I know that we're updating that report for the next quarter. So I think what I'm going to do is work, we, you know, we talked about the customer service request a little earlier. I'm going to work to include maybe a link to that customer service request in that report and try to get that out so that, you know, it's, it's available for everybody for things like debris <coughs> or, you know, if you see debris on the roadside, things like that. I don't know anything about schedule on, you know, if there is a, a, a specific schedule on, on doing those things, but for... I, I, I do think that the best way for, for bringing these things to our attention is through that customer service request. So I'll, I'll work on getting that in, the, in our report so Thank that you. it's in the agenda. Thank you. Um, a couple of years ago, I had asked um, for safety improvements at Freedom Boulevard and um, SoCal Drive where it goes over the freeway, and that was evidently um, part of Caltrans jurisdiction because it went over the freeway when the uh, Santa Cruz Public Works devised the green lanes um, they did a, a job where when you're going south on the Pacific Coast uh, bike route um, the green lane stays on the right hand side although you have to make a left turn and so you then have to go over two lanes for some reason, it just dead ends on the right-hand side instead of letting bicyclists get across the two lanes and make a left turn. On the other direction, going towards Aptos High School, still on the Monterey, on the uh, Pacific Coast bike uh, route, um, bicyclists have to go over the freeway. This was part of Caltrans. Then they have to make a left turn onto SoCal Drive. And again, uh, Caltrans approved these plans where the um, bike lane stays on the right-hand side of the road, and there's no way for a bicyclist to safely get across the two lanes to get to the turn pocket to get into SoCal. Um, can you address where the, uh, where the lack of oversight by Caltrans on this plan was? Because this makes no sense. I don't have any specifics on that. I do remember seeing that go through the encroachment permit process, but I don't have any specifics. Good morning. Good morning. Steve Trujillo of Watsonville. Um, along East Lake Avenue, which is uh, not all but part of Highway 152, uh, exiting the eastern part of the city, I have observed since I moved here from Capitola three and a half years ago, many near misses with pedestrians and bicyclists. We have no green lanes. We have no yellow uh, warning signals. It is a wide stretch of uh, street, and it turns into a racetrack about 9 p.m., <laughs> Uh, that's what I'm hearing as I'm campaigning for city council from all of the merchants along East Lake. What can Cal Cran well, Cal Crans, what can Cal Trans, I know you don't raise cranberries, what can Cra Cal Trans do about the situation and what input could I have as a potential perhaps city councilman next year or even as just a regular old ordinary citizen? Thank you. 
Again, I, I would point to the city's planning effort for that. Their study area will include the location that you mentioned. And it's city-led project. Caltrans is involved, of course, uh, not only as the administrator of that that grant program, but then also when it does come to 152, involved as a stakeholder as well. So I would point you to the city's effort for their planning study that's going on right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Good morning. Good morning. How are you this morning? Doing all right. All right. Uh, this is just a quick question. First of all, I like the fact that you're talking about 152 um, and making a crosswalk where St. Francis, the church, Lakeview is. Um, I think it's really important, and we've talked about it for years. But I'm concerned about a crosswalk only because that is such a – people are going 50 miles an hour there. And if you have people step out, it's almost like we're inviting – people to get hit. I, I, I don't know how to, else to explain it. It's, it's dangerous. And, and school time, sure, 25 miles an hour. But weekends, you've got people perking on one side, going to the other side. I mean, it's not just when school is in session. So I'm wondering if more than just a um, crosswalk, if there's some type of a bridge or overpass or a tunnel, I don't think will work because of the water level, but something more there. It needs, something needs to be done, and, and I commend you for mentioning that, but I am concerned about just putting a crosswalk there and people being hit there. Right. So That's a, that's a great point, and, and we were talking a little bit before the meeting to where right now w where we are in any kind of project stage is, is very, very early, and the way that an encroachment permit project would go is that we would work with the county to make sure that the specific design details make sense and are safe because it there's a lot of nuance and complexity to it conceptually you know we're 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 ready to move forward with with developing the project but but then when we get into the specific design details the number one priority is to make it safe and and I really appreciate that. I don't know, you know, encroachment of, of land, whether you have church land or school land or whatever, but I know people would be, I can't speak for them, but I think they would be um, really happy to have something there. And, and it's, I'm glad you're, you're addressing that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no one else, we'll move to, uh, to the main part of our meeting. Um, item number 22 is the evolution of SMART. Uh, we have a guest speaker, Farad Mansourin, General Manager of the Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit, as well as the Chair of the SMART Board. I think she's still Chair of the SMART Board. Uh, Windsor Mayor, uh, Deb, uh, Deborah Fudge. So uh, I look forward to hearing from both of them. I think uh, Mr. Dondero has a couple of opening remarks. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you essentially did a good job of introducing them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and my apologies to Mr. Mansourian for misspelling his name at least once in my staff report. Um, um, so we'll, we'll have to make amends on that later. <laughs> 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 um, just a, a little bit more about our, our, this is a continuation of our uh, speaker series of innovators in transportation. Um, we actually have uh, two different presentations today. This is the first one. Um, Ms. Fudge is the only six-time mayor in Windsor's history, and she says she was really excited to be on the board during the startup of passenger rail service in Marin and Sonoma counties. She's working hard to extend the train north to Windsor, Healdsburg, and Cloverdale, and she has um, degrees in community development and environmental planning. Creating green belts, transit-oriented development, and now commuter rail service are her life's works which she has been pleased to contribute to Sonoma County. Mr. Mansurian has worked for Marin County for 31 years, most recently as the head of Department of Public Works. He also managed the Marin County Transit Agency for 12 years and served as executive director of Marin County's Congestion Management Agency for 14 years. So he's got a deep background in transportation. In addition, Mr. Mansurian was a key figure in the 2008 effort to pass Measure A, a quarter cent sales tax approved to fund SMART service. In 2011, the SMART board reached a unanimous agreement 
with interim executive director Farhad Mansourian to become the agency's new permanent general manager. Um, a little bit of uh, comparison of the smart line to our lines and why there's uh, a, a, a bit of interest uh, coming from this county. Um, both lines uh, parallel highways that are congested for many hours of the day in a context that offers few alternative routes. Uh, both lines are single track. Um, both have existing freight service and both serve multiple established communities that continue to grow. Uh, both lines are building parallel bike pedestrian trails to serve a growing population of bike users and uh, both corridors host a heavy visitor traffic in addition to many commuters going to work and school. And finally, both corridors have a substantial number of seniors living nearby who want alternatives to driving a car. So um, back in May, the Santa Cruz Area Chamber led a group of community leaders uh, up to ride the smart train. And two of our uh, board members uh, were able to go, um, Commissioner Bertrand and Commissioner uh, Kaufman Gomez. Um, but we felt like there was uh, uh, quite a, a rich story to be told here. And so we thought, well, if we couldn't get you up there, we would bring the story here. So that's why uh, we invited our guest speakers today. So um, I'll uh, hand it over to uh, Mr. Mansourian. Or who, who's starting first? Deborah. Okay, Deborah will start. Thank you. Um, as you'll hear today, a rich story is probably an understatement about what it took to get a train running through Sonoma and Marin counties. I just wanted to give a brief, uh, you did a great job, George, with my background. Um, I've been a city council member for the town of Windsor for 22 years. And in fact, as the smart district was being formed, Windsor started building from scratch a downtown, a TOD, with three-story mixed-use buildings. And we built our own train station in 2007. The sales tax wasn't passed until 2008. So a lot of us in Sonoma and Marin had vision and on our own without any help from SMART at the time, started you know, training, planning for transportation planning. Um, so as because I was, um, you know, my appointment to SMART, I've been on the board for 13 years. So I was appointed in 2005, went through two sales tax measures. The second one was successful. So I, I've been through that background and worked with um, Farhad for years. Um, I was chair in 2010, and then I've been chair for the past two years. But I think which is, which, what is of most interest to all of you is I'm a Santa Cruzan. <laughs> so I moved here in 1970. I'm a 1974 graduate of Harbor High, the third full graduating class. My stepfather was a founding professor of UC Santa Cruz and was provost of Cowell College from 1974 to 1979. And my mom taught at EA Hall Junior High here in Watsonville, and she started their first computer lab. She started out as a home ec teacher and then taught, got a computer lab and was really concentrating on teaching the migrant farm worker kids computer skills. So um, they still live in Santa Cruz. I'm here every month helping them as they age and I age. And so I know this rail back and you know from the back of my hand I've been riding my bike along it for years and I just can't tell you how excited I am to be able to share with Farhad our experience with SMART to be able to help my own hometown because my heart is here I'm a fish out of water in Windsor and Sonoma County but my heart is always with you and I wore my sea glass here <laughs> so Farhad's going to give you a lot of information it's um, we've had a, a long road but it's it's exciting because we're here now, and there are still people, we've been in operation a year, who haven't, who are just now riding smart for the first time. We have lots of commuters, but we still have new people. And if there isn't a, there isn't a day that goes by where someone doesn't tell me and write an email or say something on Facebook, you've changed my life, my life is better, my quality of life is better, because I have an alternative, and it's, and it's really connecting our communities. People are getting to know each other. And the economic development in San Rafael alone, nobody went to San Rafael before. They're going down just to visit and get off the train and go to this restaurant called Soul, S-O-L. And as I was driving into Watsonville today, I was picturing the renaissance of downtown Watsonville. It really can help connect your communities, connect your county, and there's a lot more positive aspects to it than just transporting you. So Farhad will, will take over from here, and I'll be here for questions at the end. Oh, and for those of you on the board and, and for staff, this is our commemorative coin. So when you start a big transportation project, especially a rail, we made commemorative 
coins that we've been passing out for the last year. These are very special. The public doesn't have these. So there's one for each of you here today. So we're giving this to you. Thank you. Thank you, and welcome back to Santa Cruz. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, distinguished commissioners, Farhad Mansurian, Smarts General Manager. Thank you for having us here to share with you our story. As soon as I get the clicker, um, so our plan is in the next four hours, take you through <laughs> what we've gone over the last 50 years and exhaust you so you don't ask any tough questions at the end. Um, I, uh, our plan, uh, our chair and I, our plan is to walk you through a journey that we did since the 70s and how we got to where we are today and then kind of pause, Mr. Chairman, you decide at that time, either we go forward because we had a meeting last night um, and a large member of um, a community was there. They were asking questions. So I added some more questions uh, for yours because people said, so what is the relevancy of SMART to Santa Cruz? And so I've added some of that thoughts for you. And then you decide whether you know, we go with that. Um, so where we are, just so everybody knows where SMART is, we are north of San Francisco. Uh, the first county we connect is Marin, and the second county we correct is Sonoma. And um, we have a history of having um, rail service. Actually, you see on the left, until 60 years ago, we had passenger rail service. Um, in Marin County, and it was a big, big part of um, uh, history in Marin and Sonoma. Um, then in 1998, Smart Commission was formed, a group of people who wanted to get together and figure out what to do. Congestion was uh, getting worse and worse, and um, both counties had representatives, and they started early planning um, studies. What do we do? What kind of vehicle we buy? Where the stations should be? And how do we start going forward? And then they did a tremendous work. They also did the EIR for their vision and uh, started looking into financial planning. Well, where is this going to come from? Um, and the biggest boost for them was in 2000, where they got um, traffic congestion relief program money and they now had a big seat because state of California in particular really likes to reward communities who are getting together and are having a path forward. Nobody wants to give you money if there is a fight going on. Everybody waits till the fight settles down. And once they got into this level, the state really rewarded them and that was a tremendous uh, point of progress at that time. And then in 2004, um, our agency was formed from a commission to an actual transit agency by passage of Assembly Bill 224. So now SMART is a transit agency under the state of California. We're governed by 12 board members. They're all elected officials. They hire the general manager who he and she serves at the pleasure of the board. And then the general manager runs the district on behalf of the board. Um, in 2006, they put a quarter cent sales tax, and they almost got there, 65.3%. So consistently over majority, but not the two thirds. They spend the next two years figuring out what did we do wrong, what can we do better, and then in 2008, it passed by almost 70%. And just when everybody was planning, great, what do we do with this $900 million that they forecasted, then came the 2009, the greatest economic downfall, as you know, since the Great Depression. And boom, then everything has, had to come to a stop. Um, I had nothing to do with SMART at that time, but studying the history, I have to give the board tremendous credit because they stopped and they said, we're going to live within our means and let's make a hard choice and phase the project. As elected officials, you all know how hard that is. You just finished an election promising people you're gonna go 70 miles, and then, boom, your money is cut almost in half. What do you do then? So they survived that, and our citizenry understood. You know, when I read all the files, 
they appreciate it being told exactly what it is. We no longer have that much money. So they phased uh, the very first part of the project. So then they, in 2010, they went through a process and they selected this particular vehicle. The board was very, very adamant about this board needs to be extremely environmentally um, friendly, has to be quiet, and has to be green. And based on those specifications, Somitomo um, of Japan uh, won, and this is the car that we have, which you will see in a minute. Uh, it's Buy America compliant. It meets tier four diesel engine. That is the cleanest requirement in the country right now for diesel engine, and we already meet that for what is coming up. Level boarding, you'll see an example. Of course, ADA compliant. One of the things we later on did as I arrived is, you know, the clicky clicky sound, it's because you have a joint every 44, 45 feet. And in our case, we got rid of that and we have a quarter mile and every quarter mile, you have a joint where we also weld that. So it's a very quiet and very smooth ride. Um, in a two car um, uh, concess, we have restroom that is ADA compliant and a little coffee place where it has now become a party place because we also serve wine and beer. And it's one of the happiest commute you have in the evenings, trust me. <laughs> because we ran out of those cons consistently. Then on weekends, it's also the workers as well as the tourists, and I'm told we run out of wine and beer by 11 a.m. <laughs> so what is the inside of a car looks like? Um, ADA compliant, we, a two car system carries 321 people sitting and standing, that's a two car, and 24 bicycles. Um, and uh, when you sit down, you think you're in a first class of an airline, you have your own power outlet, and your seat reclines, and it's really a pleasant, um, a pleasant ride for you. We have tables for those who are doing their work. So if you could hit that start button for me, please. I thought we'd take you inside so you can see what the inside looks like in a, in a real world. This is a three car. Very quickly after we opened up, we ran out of capacity. Um, lots and lots of bicycle, lots and lots of passengers. So we immediately had to carry third car and that's for over 500 people and about 36 bicycles. So here is a look at what inside looks like. This is on my iPhone, so no Hollywood claim. Uh, to the left is the ADA compliant restroom. If you go the farthest distance, it's one hour, seven minutes. And uh, our board had the vision that maybe that's a little bit too long. So they created the restroom for us. Then you go through and you're now in the next car, and in that next car we have the coffee place where you can buy, um, you know, very simple snacks uh, items. We have a um, special designated area for ADA, um, and we have places where the bicycles can uh, hang their bicycles that actually hold down to them. This is our snack area. So that was the empty car. We thought we'd show you what, what not empty car looks like. We started doing a, a toy drive that has become extremely successful. And the idea is, please, during the holidays, you bring one or two toys, and we leave them on the train. And if you need toys, you take them. So some people bring them and some people take them and whatever is left, we go and give it to the other communities. Um, you know, it has become a little bit of community itself. Those people who commute, which is about 60% of our traffic is during the morning and uh, evening commute. People get to know each other and you walk in there and everybody knows who's gonna get off 
at what exit and 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 there is a lot of um, events that those people are actually um, sharing with each other Oops. So in 2012, um, we started our construction, and I'd like to share with you very quickly some of the milestones of the construction. Um, on the top, you'll see the condition of what the railroad looks like, because passenger rail service stopped 60 years ago. In some of the areas, we had freight, but in most of the area, we had no freight, so the condition was, was really bad. And so here is a quick snap. We totally reconstructed 43 miles of track. We had to rebuild 63 at grade crossings and we quickly received tremendous amount of thank you notes from motorcyclists and bicyclists because you can imagine the condition of those at grade crossings, crossing your city streets were horrible and everything was rebuilt. Um, you know, as my Caltrans friend can tell you, you go through a public works life and you're lucky in your county public works, city public works, you replace one bridge in your career life for Caltrans, maybe few. We had to replace 27 bridges that were old and we had to totally rebuild them because you now have this fast moving modern rail and heavy freight that needed to accommodate um, uh, our um, transportation. So we had to rebuild, we had to rebuild that. Then we had to rebuild the platform foundations and we also installed 43 miles of a dock bank. What does that mean? That means we buried fiber optic um, for emergency communication, train control, and something else that I will report to you in a minute. And then, of course, we had to build over 100 signal system. So very, very large public works project. And we're lucky we also opened up among the very few in the, in the country with positive train control. As you know, that is the mandate by United States Congress that by end of 2018, every rail operation in United States have to have this technology. And the purpose of the technology is to prevent certain type of accidents, the railmen, head-on collusion, and those kind of things. Very, very, uh, this is the absolute, the latest of the technology. And we're very happy that we actually opened up with that in, uh, in our service last year. Um, also, another milestones, um, we had to really create an entire organization. When I arrived at SMART, we had staff of six and zillion consultants. One of the things we did is we started now building a transit agency. We had to hire over 100 key people throughout the country, and that generated a lot of employment because for every something we were doing, it also got a lot of local businesses involved. Um, one of the, in addition to all the uh, bridges that I reported to you, we also ran into a problem where over Petaluma River Bridge, we had to replace this 100-year-old bridge where the bridge would take 15 minutes to turn so the ships can go <coughs> and the train go over it. Well, you cannot run a commute trail and a commuter train and have a 15 minute turn on a bridge. So we had to replace the bridge uh, and that was a big puzzling for the engineers of us trying to figure out what to do. We had to build a rail operation center, our dispatch center, where we control all the train movements um, and that's where everybody reports to. We build that uh, at Sonoma County Airport. One of our other missions is to build a multi-purpose path as much as possible, that money allows, and we have right away, and we have built 15 miles of it so far, and we continue building more as we get more money and we get more opportunities. Can you tell them where we got the bridge? Yes, coming up. Oh, okay. Sorry. So 
some, some of the key operating details for you. Our top speed is 79 miles an hour. When you go end to end, average speed is about 40 with all the stoppage and slowing down and opening the doors and closing the door. So 40 miles an hour compared to Highway 101, which is about one and a half mile an hour. Thanks to Senate Bill 1 that uh, Kelly was talking about, um, SB 1, we received fund immediately and we immediately put that to work and have increased our daily on weekend and weekday trips. So we immediately put that money into operations and we're providing more trips than we even anticipated right at the beginning. We serve every 30 minutes during most of the congestion area and as soon as we're able to hire more people, then we will fill in and truly have a 30 minute uh, commute in all the evening uh, and morning commute hours. We have two way operation on a single track. We chose to do single track. Our environment uh, and the preservation of our environment is very crucial as it is on the top of our list. We did not want to build two tracks where environmentally was sensitive. So we operate on a single track and we have built four passing lanes where the trains pass each other at this speed, of course, very carefully and very precisely. And um, that's one of the deals with the positive train control. And since last year, we have carried 650,000 people all the people who said nobody's gonna ride you, all the people who said this is absolutely just an expensive toy, um, now are, well, I wish I could say they're quiet, but they're not. They continue <laughs> saying, yeah, but, and we'll get into that. So we're very happy, 650,000 people who are no longer on highways and local roads and have got their life back. Environmental mitigation, when you do major public works project, as you know, for everything you do, you have to do environmental mitigations. One of the things we wanted to do and our board was adamant is instead of doing all the little mitigations here and in this county and in that city, can we do something major? And the answer was yes. So we purchased 56 acres of an area right between Marin and County and Sonoma counties. Um, and the site has been restored and you will see this is what the site looked like. It used to be an old marina where people would go and do trap shooting and you know, uh, get on their boats and go to San Francisco Bay. This is what it looked like for decades. It was just run down and we bought that and we turned that into an absolute award-winning um, marina where now you see species and animals that nobody has seen for decades and it's a beautiful area. So that was one of our big contributions, almost 60 acres of mitigation. Then um, on our pathway, um, one of the things we did is we took a step back and we said, you know, we wanna build 70 miles of pathway, how do we do that? And one of the things I had our staff do is let's go get NEPA clearance. As you know, you have CEQA for the state, but for <coughs> the federal money, you need NEPA. And thanks to Caltrans partnership, we did a NEPA for 36 miles. And we are now very much eligible and have been receiving federal funds. So it's kind of that kind of planning that you come out with a vision and then you take a step back and you figure out where you put yourself in that best position to do that. Uh, just in last uh, fiscal year, I reported to our board that we just built another 5.6 more miles of bike path at a very good cost of 5.4 million. Um, we have seven transit agencies in Marine and Sonoma, and it took us about two years to figure out together how do we coordinate your schedule and ours. When our train arrives, what happens? We wanted to make sure from the rider's point of view that you have almost a seamless. We're all different government agencies, but as a citizen, you don't care. You wanna get off bus and get on a train and vice versa. So we, we work very hard. Our transit planners, I'm very proud of them and they put a, a, a tremendous uh, relationship together. 
So finally, what we were able to do is have all of this dialed in. We're still learning. Um, one of the interesting problems we're having is because train is on its own track, we, other than something has happened, we are on time, but the buses are on the local traffic or on the regional highway traffic, and we're still trying to figure out how to dial in those final, I'm one minute early, you're one minute late, and how do we get that going? Um, we now have a lot of taxis and ride sharing and, and local jurisdictions like County of Marin, they really embrace this idea. The county provides, I, if I'm not mistaken, either 40 or $50 per employee if they're using the green commute. And so they incentivize the, the employees and then they turn around and they basically buy what I call wholesale deal of tickets from us and their employees are then getting the train ride at very, very small price. So all of that is taking place. Um, then in addition to the bike path we're building, we also build um, lockers for the bicycles. And, um, and now we're beginning to have uh, bike rentals. Actually, Metropolitan Transportation Commission, your counterpart in the, aid, uh, in the Bay Area, just gave Marine and Sonoma counties $830,000 for one year so they can start this bike share program um, at all of our stations. And of course, we're allowing the bikes on the train. Then the latest thing that has happened is now the private cars have showed up. We now, the CMAs, congestion management agencies, your counterparts, they are doing the car share, they're doing the zip card, they're having the lift discounts. Like Marine um, uh, CMA, what they do is if you get off the train, they give you a huge discount and apparently you only pay $5 uh, wherever you go. So TAM pays the discount. They, so Lyft shows up, you get on it, you go to your place of work, you pay $5 and TAM pays the rest. So it's that kind of thinking that everybody is now embracing our arrival. One of the things we heard from the employees is what if I have an emergency while I'm taking train, I need to go home because of emergency and they've come out with the guaranteed right homes. So these are the things that is falling in place very, very nicely. Um, our payment method is two way. One is on a clipper card, which as you know, everybody now in the Bay Area, all the transit agencies use. And also we developed our own app. Um, and the app is extremely popular. As you can imagine, everybody has an iPhone these days. You get on and you buy your ticket and you show that to the conductors. Um, our, our fares is based on a zone. The farther you travel, the more you pay. It has a base plus the number of zones you go through. Um, then we created more products and our uh, number one product that it's very, very fa uh, most popular is the 31 day pass. Uh, the 31 day pass for $200 you go 31 days, no limit, as many times as you like, and that's the most popular for our commuters. The same pass is half price for seniors, youth, and people with disabilities. For businesses, we created what is known as EcoPass. So IRS allows if you are spending money on public transit, and until the re recently, bicycle was considered pub public transit, but the current administration changed the definition, so now it's just transit. Y if you are spending money, there is two things you can do. One is you can buy those tickets before tax, and the second is if you buy those through your employees, then that private employer their payroll tax is reduced because they're spending money on that. So it has a great business, and for your point of view, it has that. And that's what we have, and it's called the EcoPass. Many, many of our public and private businesses are buying those EcoPasses, which um, our people use. Um, some of the smart benefits that we, are, we planned and we're looking at is, of course, it's fast. It's reliable and it's dependable. 
You know, Highway 101 um, is the spine that connects us, connects Marine and Sonoma. It is my marketing plan. It is a parking lot. I really appreciate that. On weekends, it is as bad as weekdays because of the tourism that is coming from San Francisco Marine going north. So this gives them um, an option and uh, a reliable and, an, and a dependable. So these are some of the benefits. We open our doors to full passenger service on August 25th, a uh, very festive area. And then I wanna stop and just give you, so all of this is great, but when you build such a large public works project, then you run into challenges and I call opportunities. So I'd like to share some of that with you. So this is where we started with what our stations should look like. Pretty nice. <laughs> kind of, it fits exactly what Marine and Sonoma and Santa Cruz, right? Uh, you know, it's like, and so we go through all of our process, environmental, how much money is available, and the community input. And then we actually end up building this, which is simple but practical, level boarding, 48 inch above, and fully ADA compliant. Um, the location of the stations was one of the challenges. Uh, fortunately, it happened before my time. So by the time I showed up, Deb and the rest of the board members had to go through this. So now all I could do is say, yeah, this is good or not. But I always said it's good. Um, we ran into interesting um, items that I want to run by you. So imagine we run um, trains 60 years ago. So our right of way was, was there. Um, but as things were going very smoothly, we discovered a tree. And if you look at this tree and you look at very much on top, you see that it has white uh, leaves. And so the construction guy was ready to cut it down. Uh, remember, this is in our right of way, so that means the tree is only 50, 60 years old because prior to that there was passenger service. And I had an activist who come to me and says, Farhad, what if this tree can cure cancer? Uh, and, and I'm like, okay, well, let's study that. So we studied the tree. I got experts from UC Berkeley to come in and look at it. They looked at it. They said, nah, this is just maybe it's a disease. Cut it. And I said, OK, can I have that in writing that this is just a nothing tree? And they did. Well, the community started talking more, and the experts started being divided. And the idea was this is a rare chimeric albino tree that there is only 10 of them in the world. And you can imagine, you see how big it is compared to the guy standing next to it. So what do you want to be? As a transit agency, you want to be the one who cut the cancer curing tree, <laughs> but you have it in the letterhead that says it's good, right? Or do you actually do something about it? And I went to my board and I said, what do I do? And the chair and everybody said, you make all that money, you go make the decision. Then we see if you made the right decision or not. <laughs> so I made the decision. It became a major operation of moving the tree and the, the roots. Um, you can imagine this is now about 10 story tall. And we have all these utility lines overhead, the services, so it became an entire operation. We're very proud of that because we moved this tree. We took 1,000 DNA samples from it in case this is a cancer curing tree and it dies during transportation and those are safe in different laboratories where they keep these kind of things. I'm happy to report to you the train, the tree is doing fantastic in its new place. It has a plaque next to it, and everybody looks at it. And the number one question I'm asked is, so how much did this cost? Which I always say. And the next slide, right? Because <laughs> I learned whatever, if I tell the true number, then it's 50% love it, and 50% say another government waste. So next item, how's that? <laughs> um, 
we had to replace the bridge over Petaluma River. Replacing a bridge where ships go under it and train goes over it is something between 35 and 50 million dollars. And our budget did not have a 35 to 50 million dollar budget. It's that simple. So I dispatched our team of engineers and I said, you get out of the typical thinking that we do as engineers, what is the safest way, and let's figure out what we can come up with the safest, uh, but something very unique. Well, we found that United States Coast Guard had just installed a bridge in Galveston, Texas. Uh, the channel was no longer wide enough, and they wanted to get rid of the bridge, so we bought a used bridge. I took that item to my board and there was almost no comments but everybody was staring at me like really and I said well here is the math we can save 20 million plus and the board to their credit said okay so that's what we did we bought this bridge we transported it and we x-rayed every pieces of it we built a new foundation and the bridge won the California Bridge Project of the Year two years ago. We now have an 80-year bridge, which, by the way, it turns at 110 seconds, where ships go under it and the bridge comes up. So challenges and opportunities. One of the big things that we do during construction, and we do constantly, is connecting with our community. Um, young, experienced, Latino communities, other communities, we want them to know what is happening with their train, what is coming up, how, and a lot of safety education. Some of the slides for you. We created this website where it teaches people about public um, safety. If you haven't had train operation in your town for a long time, there are generations who've never seen the train. Our generation was grown with train, but the younger generation don't know that. Uh, and they continued um, driving or walking and riding their bike the way they are. So that was a big, big challenge for us. Uh, we go to every single elementary and junior high and high school, and we have sessions one-on-one. -on -one. We show them films how to be what we call track smart. Total cost of the project, including the phase we are doing today, which is connecting us to Larkspur, is about 533 million. As you can see on this pie chart, about 78% was our money, and the rest we were able to get from state, federal. This is the capital cost? This is everything, correct. Capital cost and everything up to opening day. Uh, freight service update, we have another government agency known as North Coast Rail Authority. They have easement on our tracks to run freight, and they have hired a freight operator, very much like what you have done. And right now, uh, there is a Senate bill that has passed the Senate and is in the Assembly called Senate Bill 1029. And Senator McGuire is proposing to get rid of the North Coast Railroad Authority and transfer all of their freight duties to SMART and also preserve 150 miles way beyond our limit for a trail that they want to build. His vision is to have a trail system from Golden Gate Bridge for 300 miles north. Um, and as I said, it has passed through the Senate and it's going through the committees, um, not a single opposition so far on the assembly side. Um, what is it that we're going to do next is, as I mentioned, we are building our next connection to Larksburg that gives us a ferry connection to San Francisco. Our business community are very, very excited about the ability of people who are coming from San Francisco and don't want to drive on 101 parking lot is to take the ferry and then to take the train. Um, the business community sees tremendous amount of um, growth. That should open by end of next year. Um, the next one is going north is Windsor, happens to be Debs town. 
Uh, that project is 55 million. We finished CEQA. The design is 20% done. And we just received, within the last two months, a 21 million from State of California, SB1 money, and 40 million from the Regional Measure 3. So this is now fully funded, and uh, we are beginning the preliminary design and hope to finish that as well. Then we have um, two more to go, Hillsburg and Cloverdale. And those, we finished environmental, we finished the 20% engineering. And then one of the interesting things is if you are familiar with Marine and Sonoma, um, Highway 37, a state highway, connects Marine and Sonoma going east-west to Highway 80. And it is another parking lot. State of California and the rail plan, they approached us and they said, we want you to look into putting rail. We already have freight going there as a passenger service. And um, I met with the Secretary of Transportation, he and his deputy, their vision is connecting communities throughout the state on a state rail plan with, um, uh, with rail. And they asked if we could do this. And I said, of course. Can I see some money to do that? And they just gave us money, and we're going to start that planning. So they're very, very serious about doing this, and they put their money where their mouth is. They're not just requiring you. They have you do it. Um, lessons learned <coughs> in, in later on. I am speaking on behalf of Deb and I. I'll be happy to come back, spend many hours with you on a long workshop, and share with you some of the lessons we learned on the governance model, funding options, planning, and environmental, the lessons learned that we would have done different during our EIR, during our planning process, share with you engineering and capital programs, why we were successful, when do you go out for bed, when do you manage this, when do you manage that, uh, the construction phase, how do you handle that, and then finally operation and testing. So we've learned a lot in that last six, seven years and we want to um, we want to share all of that with you. I'll recommend that a number of workshops, but if you'd like to come up there and look at what we've built and spend the day and talk about this and meet other board members, I think it'd be terrific for you to get that feel of what we went through. So Mr. Chairman, that's what it is. I just have a couple of more slides to kind of get you to think because that's, this is what I've added. So, so what? Okay, this is great. Thank you, Smart, you did a great job. What's in it for us? And that's what I start putting in. Is, is our case applicable to you? So what I'm putting down is for us, Highway 101 is a parking lot. We couldn't move, our emergency people couldn't move. It is simply um, a very, very bad situation for us. Those who were using buses and van pool, they were stuck on the same highway than everybody else was. Um, that was our situation. The housing cost forced people to live further, further, further away. And employers were having very hard time getting employees. Um, and typical commute hour was 60 to 90 minutes. So this was our life. Does this sound any familiar with you? Yeah. It's, you know, you replace 101 with 17 and 1, you're having the same issues. Um, for many years, our opposition uh, would want us to do nothing. For many years, our opposition would say the train to nowhere, um, it will never get built. They would say it will promote high density. It will change the character of the community. By the way, there has not been a single high density built uh, in the last seven years that we've been doing the train. Because strong land use by the local jurisdictions, just like yours, that's what controls, not us. Um, it will change the character of the community I'm sharing with you. And of course, SMART's going to cut thousands of trees and um, and it will not solve Highway 101 problem. They immediately wanted to know if I spend $100 million, how many lanes of 101, in your case 17, are you going to free up? They were using for those simple mats. Uh, it will cost more. Fares are too high. We haven't even established it yet, but they predicted that fares be too high. 
uh, the proposed tax, which was the quarter cent sales tax, that that discriminates. Um, no one will write it anyway, so what is it you're just building? Your forecast is too high, and we did 18 ridership studies, just so you know. So if you really want to do a ridership study, I urge you ask George to call me first before you do 18 of them, because none of them agree with each other. Your opponents disagree with all of them. Your supporters will say they're low, and your opponents will say they're high. And then the real world is when you open your doors. Um, staff doesn't know what they're doing. The staff is getting paid too much. Uh, everything, I'm just mentioning. And then my favorite is the fuzzy math. And to be honest with you, I've been reading some of your stuff, and the fuzzy math is right there. You know, 2 plus 2 is 17, but alternative doing nothing is great. Um, just letting you know. So we went through all of these, and again, uh, if any of these you're already hearing, I just want you to know it's there. Um, I want to share with you, we are looking at SMART as an option, not a silver bullet. There is no silver bullet. I mean, my 39 years of practicing as a civil engineer, we civil engineers can take you to the moon, but you, we cannot get you out of your congestion, congestion with a silver bullet. You need options. This is what our people learned. We need options. Uh, for us, train and the bicycle path are two options. That's all we're giving you. In addition to your car, your bus, your ferry, whatever other mode, we're giving you options. The train is fast and reliable. The bicycle is fast, is reliable because we're on our own path. We're not part of the highway. Uh, that's what we're giving you. It's an alternative to reduce your congestion, health and environmental benefits, and jobs and economic growth. I cannot emphasize to you how happy our downtowns are and how happy those local jurisdictions are Without mentioning names, we had a mayor of a town. Deb and I and other board members had to assure the mayor the world is not going to come to an end when we show up because there were all these fears. And the mayor is so happy because the businesses are so happy. Their businesses has grown by 30%. Going back to that number, 600,000 people, just think about this. This is our first year. We're still learning. Where were these 600,000 people before? They were, they're not new people. That's, that's, they were on local roads, highways. Whatever they were doing, they're now coming in on, on the train. Um, so does any of these apply to you? This is what I put together. So we have uh, a report card because on August 18, we have a celebration. Our board just declared our first year birthday is August 18 and 19, free service for everybody. So it'll be a great time to visit us on Highway 18. On, on August 18, we have a big celebration. And our report card is as follow. More than 650,000 people, passengers that we have carried. More than 58,000 bicycles. So we now have a core group of our commuters, about 10% who are using the bike as their first and last mile. So it's not instead of or fighting, it is us together figuring out how to build more facilities for them on the train as well as off the train. And, oops, sorry. And we've carried over 2,800 people using wheelchair. Those people are now telling us that they have a new way of going up and down and have independence. They now can get on a train, get off, go to a restaurant, and come back. We're getting a lot of good comments there. Um, the fare box recovery beyond our budget. Our chief financial officer, she's very, very happy. I provide that report to our board every month. So on the money side, we're doing very good. And here is what I want to leave you with. Since 2011 that I arrived, because our board put local money and because we started building, we have brought in $157 million. And we just got another $40 million. 
from state and federal and, and regional. People will watch you, and if you're fighting among each other, I'm talking about us, nobody's interest was interested to help us. As soon as we started building and we started um, going forward, the state, regional, and the feds want to help you, especially they want to help you finish it. And that's what it has come. So once we started demonstrating, and you know, 157 million goes into that pie chart that you saw, and it will only get more and more. So that's really all the items I wanted to share with you. I'll be happy to answer any questions, and of course, the president of our board, but we wanted to give you a quick rundown of what is our world. So thank you for your time. We'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate the presentation. I'm sure there's going to be questions, and we'll also be taking comments from, from the public. But I just, your, your uh, experience in Sonoma and Marin is, is very important for us to hear. Um, just work my way down here, uh, Ms. Brown. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I just wanted to ask a, a question about the relationship between the rail line functioning and, and the trail portion of your project. Uh, as you noted that about 15 miles of the trail has uh, been developed and significantly more than that, uh, miles of uh, rail line and operation. So I, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, uh, the logistics of the relationship between the, the two, uh, the, the rail and the trail. I mean, there, as you know, and I believe it was true in, in your communities, that there are many people who really want to see a, a trail, a bike and ped trail now. And uh, to the extent that we can make those, uh, you know, work in synergy with each other, uh, that's our goal. So if you could talk a little bit about that, it would be, I think, helpful for all of us. Great question. Remember I said if you decide to go forward, I like to you know, bring my team back and have them work with your team even during the planning process. You know, you have beautiful sketches during the planning process that says I'm going to put the rail here, I'm going to put the bike here, I'm going to put the tree there, and then somebody there. Well, if you don't, once you get into construction and actually building those, you start looking into the environment, the regulations, you will very quickly see, okay, maybe I should not set that, maybe I'll come up with a different plan. So lessons learned is, is figure that piece out. In our case, where the rail and the trail go, it is on such a sensitive environmental area that it's simply a red line for our community and certainly my board. And so we, as a railroad, you're existing, and you can reconstruct with no regulation and permits or very little. As a bike, you're not existing. You have to go through all these reviews. As I speak today, we have two lawsuits against us on the bike side. Property owners who say, you can build a bike path here. We don't want it for all the wrong reasons, but we don't want it. So that's number one. The second that you need to be very careful, and this is what happened to us, the property that you now have purchased has probably three types of ownership. The smallest piece is what you write on own. The other two pieces is you either have easement or you are operating because for since 1800s, a farmer gave it to the next person, to the next person. And if you start drilling into those descriptions, it will say for rail. So we're being challenged when we're putting bicycle and trails by those people saying, this is not rail. So we're going through those. That's why they're getting slower. And the cost is also very high. So. We're still committed. We want to do the right thing. It's absolutely a big part of our mission. We just need to be, you know, much more thorough during the beginning part of it. I hope this answered your question. Mr. Rockin. I, I thank you, first of all, for your presentation. It was very, very helpful. 
Um, my first question is, what's the population base that is being served? I mean, I'm not counting San Francisco, I might use it, but the commuter potential population that's within the two-county area that the track runs through. Marine is about 250,000, Sonoma about 500,000, so population base about 750. And um, you gave us an overall cost for the construction. Do you have in your head or ability to say what the cost per mile was for the construction of the for the No, I mean cost? if you if you take that and divide it by forty three, then you come out with a cost. But I wanna I wanna give you one caution. By doing that, please don't apply that to yours because people tend to do that. Here is why. Your environment might be harder or much easier. Right. You might not have forty some bridges. You might have more bridges. You might have less bridges. So be careful of that. That's why during planning process, having engineers who have built, not engineers who can just give you on paper, who have built rail, because that's when you have a lot of opportunities in doing cheaper construction. Um, the third item is the timing. You must spend, this is, if, if I was, you, you know, your guy, I would be saying during good economic time, you want to do your environmental, your design, and get ready. And as soon as the economy turns, you start building. Two big reasons. You get much better prices, and you put everybody back to work. And this is what we did. We put thousands of people back to work when there were no major projects going. So that timing becomes very critical. And of course, you get the biggest bang for your buck. So you've only been operating for a relatively small period of time now. What Do you know what your operating cost is actually per hour for running this service? Not per hour. Our entire operation is 17 million. Our entire agency budget is about 30 million. but. The 30 million, most of it goes to paying off the bond for, for the construction that we did. And but 17 million is our uh, operation cost. And in terms of the um, the, the service, the, I'm trying to understand, um, you, you had a lot. You started with local money, which has made the uh, state and the federal government interested in supporting you. What were the sources for your funding for the local? Quarter cent sales tax. That was it. That was correct. The so basically, what what we told the community, we said, look at your congestion. Look at your. Op this is an option. The message that we were giving is every time you spend hundred dollars, you're giving me twenty five cents. <clears throat> Okay. That's that, that's the quarter cent sales tax. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your presentation. Thank you, sir. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair. So you mentioned, uh, I, I would imagine during the campaign, you a big part of it was congestion relief. And you've um, alluded to the fact that there's been significant congestion relief uh, on Highway 101 as these trains. How many cars before and after in terms of of, of, you know, morning and afternoon commutes. Um, what is the delta? What is the difference now that your train is running in terms of number of cars going down 101 and in the afternoon coming back? So I'm going to, I'm not escaping your question, but I want to give you a different thinking because. Oh, I need it, believe me. No, the, the <laughs> reason, the reason is, um, Highway 101 carries over 100,000 people. If you would look at, this is a day, if you would look at our 3,000 people ridership a day, and you would simply say 3,000 compared to 100,000, right? You don't even put a dent, even if you reduce 100,000. I'm doing a math exercise, but this is important for you to to, to, to let me do. Sure. And you go to 97,000, and then you reach a conclusion that, well, that ain't gonna do any good. And then you add $500 million expense to that, and you say, this is absolutely no go. So I wanna give you a different, different way of looking at it. You spend $500 million, and it's a one-time money, you now have a system for 30 years plus. We carried 600,000 in the first year. Is that 
is that 300,000 each way? Yes, let's assume that, okay. right? So you, where did these 600,000 people do before? This is what I say in my debates. What were they doing before? These are not new workers. These are the same school children and the same people who go on up and down. They used to be on lo your local roads and your local highway. Now they're on a train. When I talk to the mayor of San Rafael and say, has your downtown changed? Is it like you see tens of thousands of people a day? No, except all those people who used to go on a single automobile, they now are on their bike or on you. So you start looking at it that way. The math makes a lot of sense and the option gives you a lot of sense. So don't forget, we look at the bike path and the train as two options, not two silver bullets. No, I understand that. We will never, we will never carry enough people that will change a difference to 100,000 per day on Highway 101. We just but, won't. But even in your report, you talk about congestion relief. It's not real. Um, How is it not real? Where were these 600,000 before? OK, where were the 600,000 before? I'm talking about the eff efficacy in relationship to the dollars that are invested in something like this. So you're talking about $600,000 million, plus you have an operating expense of, what, $17 million. Then when you start talking about uh, uh, fare box recovery, what is the percentage of fare box recovery? In other words, how much has to be subsidized by taxes or, or the taxpayer? Um, I mean, you said it exceeded expectations, but the, it's what fair revenue divided by the operating expenses, uh, right? So I give you all the answers. These are very good questions, but I want to, uh, if, I, if I can, show you if that's where you want to go, you can build anything. Your highway doesn't make sense. Your highway system is subsidized every single day. Your local road is subsidized every single day. Public transit is subsidized every single day. Our money comes from the quarter cent that our taxpayers are giving us. That's what they're giving us, about 30 million a year. We use that, we bond it, we used it for capital, and now we're using it for operation. That's what the citizens decided to do. 25 cents every time they spend 100. There is no other subsidy. That's what it is. Every time you go to a gas pump, you're paying about 40 cents of tax. And that's how you're subsidizing for local roads and highways. So that math, if you, as I said, if you want to look at it, then take the 600,000 multiple by 30 years and compare that cost to the one-time cost of building a system that gives you options. And then we also looked at, is there an option of doing nothing? Is that what the citizens want? And they said, no, we want you to do something. Well, widening the freeway in the environment we are, we didn't want to do that because they're very critical environmental sensitive area. If you had all the money in the world, would you divide, did you add four more lanes to Highway 1 and 17? Is that feasible? I don't know. But that, those are what we went through. So our constituents are very happy. We got 70% of the vote. And all I can report to you is they're asking for more, not less. Uh, one last question. And uh, forgive me, you know, you did bring in the kind of political uh, option with respect to what we're doing here in Santa Cruz County. So I, so I have to be, ask a few tough questions. So in our packet today, um, Progressive Railroading, it talks about the agency's tackle first and last mile challenges. And embedded in there, it says ridership, and I don't know exactly, this is in LA, ridership, a rail ridership has grown as the agency has opened new lines. It's primarily bus service that is declined excuse me, that has declined. Help me understand a little bit, is there a ratio between the number of, of um, trips per day on the rail versus, has there been a decline in the number of, of metro and bus uh, ridership? Not that I know. The way we look at it, there are three types of services. Golden Gate Bridge provides regional service, people who are going from Sonoma County to San Francisco. We don't go to San Francisco, that hasn't changed. Then we have local city buses, which they're circulating around the city. We don't provide that service. 
we don't have people who get on here and go one station. I mean, we do, but as a whole, we don't. Where we are affecting is people who were stuck in 101 from 6 a.m. to 8.30 and from 2.30 till 5. That's the service we're providing, plus the tourism and the, especially the weekends. Is it fair to say that the cities that are the destination points, help me understand a little bit, I kind of understand San Francisco, but is there also an East Bay component of, you know, from Oakland to Richmond to, um, and, and other cities along the, the 80 corridor that, that this service um, applies to? This service provides a parallel service to the Highway 101 spine gets you there fast if your schedule works. Not everybody takes the train because it doesn't go everywhere and the schedule doesn't work for you. So that's that. It, for those that it does, it provides a faster and more reliable service. We have a small number of our workforce that goes to San Francisco or East Bay. I don't know about your demographic here. In Marin and Sonoma, Almost 75% of our traffic is generated inside the county. They're going from one workplace to the next workplace, back to the next workplace. So we're not like BART that is crossing many different counties. We are providing those internal circulations an option to get there faster. It's the Sonoma folks working in Marine. It's the Marine folks working in Sonoma. That is what it's really serving the most. One last uh, point. I don't want to dominate here. But one last point. Would it affect your reasoning in any way that if you knew that most of the people who travel on Highway 1 during the morning, 61% of them don't go into Santa Cruz, Capitola, Soquel. They go over the hill to, uh, to San Jose or Scotts Valley or, or Highway 17. Do you see where... On the one hand, you have like a, from point A to point B, it's pretty straight, but here you have people that in no way would ever use a train because they're being diverted to San Jose. How would that affect your reasoning in terms of the uh, efficiency of a, of, a, of a train in Santa Cruz I'm County? seeing my Santa Cruz expert coming up to take that question out. We have something in common. I've been on the city council for 22 years, oh, and, have I, you? and I've been mayor six times. So. Okay, there you go. There, I have a counterpart. Yeah. So knowing your county like I do and, and looking at what happens in Marin and Sonoma counties is we have a few people, not everybody will do this, but people will transfer modes of transit. So we have people in Marin and Sonoma County who, who go to the Larkspur Ferry, and then, or, you know, they'll, right now we don't go to the Larkspur Ferry, so they... Tra they travel to downtown San Rafael, they get on a bus that we provide that gets to the ferry and then they get on the ferry. So what I can envision for you is the people in Watsonville trying to move north, trying to, trans to go north, and those that may go over the hill to San Jose to work at Apple or Google or anywhere else, I could see them taking the train to, a, to the most northern stop and then catching the <coughs> bus that would go over the mountain. So there are people that will try to get out of their cars and try to make um, easier transportation choices that are, and it also is they can work while they're on the trains. They're more relaxed when they get there. It's sort of a quality of life as well as congestion. But I, you know, people, some people will get on a train from the Southern County, go to the most Northern stop, and the buses could meet them and just take them straight over the hill. So I could yeah. see some people doing that. Uh, uh, maybe a point of information, uh, Mr. Dondero, did you have information that, that was asserted that 61% of the people go uh, over the hill? Um, yeah, I, I, I take issue with that number. Okay. Um, I, Luis just looked up in our RTP, our Regional Transportation Plan, um, and 77% of people who commute stay within our county. Now, that's not all on Highway 1, but um, so... Uh, I, I, I know the, the number I remember working on, on the Highway 1 EIR is that about 30% of the people on Highway 1 divert up 17. Now, 17 is a busy road for sure, but a lot of those people come from Westside Santa Cruz, uh, Scotts Valley, and so forth. So it's not all just coming off of Highway 1. So it may be similar in terms of I, uh, I think there's a lot of similarity to the numbers that you provided. Um, and there, I just thought of something that we haven't discussed yet, is that the train is also an option during emergencies. We, our train was used during the fires. 
the first pictures that we saw October 10th from the 6,000 houses that burned down in, in Sonoma County came from the train. The engineers were taking pictures outside the windows of the train, and that's the first time we saw the extent of the devastation was the 419 train going south. We had people get on the train with their suitcases to evacuate. So they did that on their own without us planning. So now we're working with communities and all the fire agencies to really make a plan so that when an earthquake happens, we're having a lot of 3.5 earthquakes up in Windsor right now, so we're expecting a bigger one, that we've got a plan in place so there can be organized evacuations on the rail should the rail still be in good shape. And so because 101, a bridge could go down and then we would be stuck. Like we, 101 is our only quarter to San Francisco. We're not like, you know, San Jose or Los Saltos or the peninsula where we have Highway 280, Highway, you know, 101. You know, we only have one option. So that, this is also good in the face of emergencies. And I think that would be good here, having lived through the 1989 earthquake here as well. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bertrand. Yeah, to um, Executive Director, um, Oh, to the mayor of Windsor. <laughs> I remember the water world in Windsor oh. when that was just a little dinky highway and I, I never had a chance to stop there because dad was on a hell-bent trip to get up to somewhere like Butt Reservoir or whatever to go camping. But um, like it certainly changed yeah. your town. So um, this is actually to the director. I'm sorry to bring you back. So I was trying to ask myself how much money you're spending on lawsuits. So, for various issues that have come up, whether they're like right away issues or people that are worried about the tree that might cure cancer or somewhere in between. But my real issue is uh, how do you gauge with the public? Um, I assume that over the course of your, your story involved in this project, um, obviously there was a campaign issue. We went through a campaign issue. So there's some similarities. I'm wondering what you learn in terms of reaching out to the public, trying to um, help them understand the issues involved. Um, one particular point, if you could cover, is transparency. Uh, another point I wish you could cover is um, reaching out to the individual concerns, some are organized, of the community so that you could hear where they're coming from and try to, um, if not ally those fears, incorporate their suggestions, which um, in many cases are pretty good. So if you could give us some of your wisdom that you've learned, I'd really appreciate it. You know, during the um, campaign, which I was not part of, um, there were all these fears and there were all these questions that you could never answer. And even if you would answer, they would simply say, well, we disagree. And then, you know, go do another ridership study and another um, during construction, a lot of attempt was made to stop us because now um, when they said you will never get going, now you are going. Then we got to the testing and you now have a new phenomena that you haven't had in 50, 60 years, right? And then we opened our doors and came um, those who were very supportive, great. Those who were not, and all we said, our campaign was come and try it. Train is not for everyone. Trail and bike is not for everyone. If it fits your schedule and if you're healthy enough to ride the bike or you like to be healthy enough, use it. Where we are today, the leaders of the opposition haven't changed. As a matter of fact, I was reading some of the anti stuff for you. They're quoting those guys in Marine and Sonoma as part of their reasoning. So it seems like they're using the same set of argument. None of the numbers matter. <coughs> nothing, nothing has changed. Um, other than that, the story I want to tell you is most of our opponents were centered in a town where I live. And everybody was from that town. And as soon as I got on Smart, the board warned me. It's like, watch out for your town, because everybody in that town is trying to stop you. That town, the city council just voted to spend $8 million of their money to build the third station. In other words, just in one year, that town that was trying to stop now says, I want more. 
because their chambers, their students, their seniors, everybody asked for, and my board just approved, we build the third station. learning. Um, I travel a lot on the train, day and night, different times, as I have my managers do, and I know many board members do. And we ask people, what's going on? What are your thoughts? What are we doing right and what are we doing wrong? And the number one comment is, you need to have more train, you need to have later train, I like to go to dinner and come back late, and we're, those then become financial issues as well as hiring issues. So you never stop communicating, it's only the beginning. And their input is absolutely crucial for our success. I hope I answered your question. You sort of did. I, I think that um, there's always a natural tension between the public and its concerns and whatever elected body that there is that's representing them, whether on a city or a county basis. I think it's a natural thing. I think it's healthy to have that tension. Um, I don't think it's something that should be denigrated. I think it's something that should be worked with. Um, I'm a major um, proponent of transparency. I think whenever agency, including this agency, George, is doing something, call a spade, as you said. Um, right now, as most of you are aware of, I'm very concerned about um, our investment study that's coming up, which just got put off uh, for a bit of time. And so I, I really caution the public to not take that for granted. I think that public involvement in that study, the analysis of the study once we get it is very important. Um, did you have anything comparable to that in your experience? So when the board first, the small board, the small board went through a period where they had two different general managers in about four months. And smart board reached out to my county board of supervisors, as where I was public works director, and asked to borrow me. And when I, and my board said, go help out. This board, when Deb was on it, asked me to do two things, talk about transparency. One, the opponents are saying there is a $30 million shortfall, is this true? And second, is this project doable, or are we truly wasting our money? And I spent about four months interviewing, reading files, and talking to everybody who knew, including the opposition. And I came back to the board. By the way, the board said, we want you to report that in a public setting, not in a confidential, you know, just go out and say it. I informed the chair and the vice chair on a Friday night that I finished my study. And the chair said, go for it. And I said, what do you mean? I'm, I mean, I'm a county guy dealing with supervisors. They're complicated, life, county council. And I'm like, just go for it. They said, go for it. So I called the press conference. And I said on the first question of opponents saying this is $30 million shortfall, is this true? And I said the answer is no. They're $70 million short. <laughs> Number two, can this project be built? And I said, yes, you need to have people who have built projects who know how to do project because you go through different phases. Construction and design and implementation are very different. You have made a lot of assumptions that has made your cost very high because you don't have details or you don't have people who have built projects. You have consultants who've never built projects, you know, and they go look at somebody else's numbers. And I said, you can build this project and you can even go further, which is exactly what we did. So that's how we started with our transparency. On our website, all the financial information is there. 
I require one of the things that we, we did, I require our CFO to have a financial report at every month and a quarterly project report and everything is posted on the same day on our website. So we're doing everything right now, to be honest with you, other than the diehard opponents who haven't changed anything. Not, no argument has changed. The people who are coming to our board are simply people who want more. They're not questioning whether this was a good idea or not. They're simply saying, I want more. I want more choices and I want more options, which we say we're working on it. Or now I'll head this the way, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Bratorf. I want to thank you both for taking the time to come and make the presentation. Your insight, your vision, uh, your candor is invaluable to us. I, I really have no questions. I, I just appreciate you taking the time to come here and let us know of, of an option that we possibly could have. Thank you. Um, again, I concur, too, with the, the presentation, and I'm sure that the public will have a lot more interest in it. I, I'll try and keep my questions brief. One is, um, I, I didn't hear too much talk about the freight and the relationship with freight on the corridor with, a pas uh, with the passengers. Uh, w coming from Watsonville, we're using that as a freight corridor right now. We may not have so much volume, but has it changed? Has it increased? Um, timing? What, what is your relationship between passenger and freight? Great question. So... We are the controller of the railroad. We dispatch both passenger and freight. And right now, because we operate in a positive train control mode, and they're not, they have to comply by end of the year, we only authorize them to operate when we're not. And that's between midnight and 4 a.m. And we have worked that out with the freight, and they have in turn worked that out with the businesses that they serve. Going forward, if the Senate bill passes and we do become both passenger and freight, um, my vision, subject to my board's approval, is to really be able to expand the freight. A lot of the freight traffic is on your highways, isn't it? That's how they're moving goods, and that's where there is a lot of green gas issue. We did one uh, connection for um, one of the beer, this, um, you know, major beers in Sonoma, and they said that they have replaced 100 truck traffic a week because of the connection that the freight now has. Uh, the connections are expensive; they're three to five hundred thousand. Um, so if we can figure out, and I'm talking to um, the rail division of um, Caltrans and State uh, Transportation Agency, they're very much seeing that, and they want those trucks off their highway as well. So there is a big opportunity, but we can't do that till the state legislation goes through and my board becomes the board for both functions. But, but other than that, we regulate them and we allow them to operate when we think it's safe. And my other question that isn't at all related, and since you're looking at your one-year anniversary, it may take a little bit of time and reflection. Comment-wise, you're saying that the communities are, are engaged with this, but what about um, what findings are you coming up with or that they're, they're sharing with you about the economic um, vitality uh, as a result of this going through their communities? And um, obviously there's more sales going on, there's more tax revenue being generated. Have we seen or have you seen um, those kind of changes um, yet, even though it's pretty, pretty new? We have, um, and I'm trying to get those substantiated in a different way than our folks. Our community outreach folks went, and I'm kind of telling you this my plan was to tell my board this. In October, we're having a workshop where I'm giving them a lot of information. We've been surveying our people. Where are you coming from? Where are you going to? What time are you coming and going? Why are you taking the train? Are you sorry that you're taking? We're, we're asking them a lot of questions, and we're trying to let our board know and our community. One of those is we surveyed everywhere there are within a mile, there are businesses. We ask our community outreach, get off and ask those, do you see a difference ever since Smart Train has come? And many of the businesses have seen substantial increase to their business, and they say it's directly because of the Smart Train. And the reason they say that is they can say when the train arrived. 
and calms this group of people. But I'm trying to substantiate that beyond he said, she said, and see how we can put that together. So. Thank you. Ms. Johnson, any questions? Mr. Caput. Yeah, thank you uh, for your report. Uh, I guess with everything, you've answered pretty much all the questions. They're pretty, uh, they were good questions. With everything, there's a benefit and, and a burden. So the benefit, of course, is uh, uh, somehow relieving some of the traffic and everything off the roads. And then the, the burden, of course, is the cost and how much it's worth for the public to get involved. But, you know, it comes down to there's not one solution for uh, all of the problems that we do have with traffic and people wanting to get somewhere. Um, even, even widening and adding lanes and everything to the freeway is only going to benefit so many people and so many, it takes so many, you know, uh, some of that burden off. It, it, what you're talking about is it looks similar in a way to BART, how BART works. And BART is uh, at the end of the year, even though a lot of people are using it, um, they're, they're not in the black, they're in the red, right? So how much in the red are, uh, is the system each year if you, the fare is not paying for everything. How much does, uh, percentage-wise, does the fare pay for the operation of what you're talking about and how much extra that you actually need from the public? So, by choice, my board wanted to make the fare very affordable. This is, if you were my board, that would be one of your decisions. Do you want to be affordable or not? And remember, our source of money funding comes from sales tax. So when people voted for 25 cents every time they spend $100 for 20 years, that's where I'm getting the money. The fair revenue is only 12, 13%, which is like 4 million, and that's by design. Again, if you're operating a train agency and bicycle, you will have a steady source of income, wherever that is. It's not going to come from your fare box recovery. You know, very, very few transit agencies in the nation get above 60 70%. Public service, whether it's roads or local roads or local highway or bus or transit, in order for it to be affordable, must be subsidized, and they are, by your gas tax. Every day you pump, you're subsidizing the roads. Here, it's the sales tax. That's how we get our money. And then again, the benefit and the burden on uh, who it's benefiting and who the burden is on. In a um, lower income area, um, if somebody wants to actually commute and they they're can get a job, let's say, let's say $14 an hour in Santa Cruz and they want to go from Watsonville. Is, uh, is it going to be affordable for them? Uh, and how much of the burden is when they're paying uh, sales tax and everything like that when they're buying something? So what I'm getting at is the... Uh, uh, I don't want to just see uh, upper-income people riding this uh, beautiful train back and forth. Uh, what percentage would you say, uh, has there been a study on how many are lower income that are actually using the service up in the, your area? And um, how many um, people that are using it are actually going uh, uh, back and forth maybe with jobs or shopping and people that have a lot of money? You know, you're asking great questions. Some of them... I haven't figured out how I'd be able to ask that question, yeah. which is during a survey, say, so, you know, uh, Mrs. Johnson, can you say how much is your income? It's like, no, I'm not going to tell you that. What I can observe for you is this. I don't see a lot of rich people using the train on a daily basis. This is our observation. I see folks who are going places, your school, your public works, your teachers, 
your policemen. The reason I know that is we give them a special ID. Um, and other workers, people who have the ability to use the train. Some people need their cars. Some people need to go where the train doesn't go. But those who can, I see these people who are, remember, um, most of our commuters are morning and afternoon. I'm sorry. I'm about the price of gas. Now. Right. And so that's who we're seeing. The biggest debate my board had, which you will go through, is what will that price be, right? And that's what we did. We had a workshop, then we had conversations, and you adjust it. Um, if your source of revenue is from a sales tax or another source, now you can, as policymakers, adjust your fare box recovery to what your community needs. Does that make sense? Because that is not your source of income. Your source of income is your sales tax, parcel tax, however you're going to do it. Uh, that's, really, that's really what it is. In terms of, in terms of benefits, I also want to remind us, what is the option of doing nothing? That's, that's what we need to look at. What will happen to your employers who can get employees? The congestion gets to a point nobody wants to go. What will happen then? Then you start seeing stores close. And stores close, you see neighborhoods start changing character. Those are the kind of things, what is the cost of doing nothing? Those are very, very substantial to the health of your county and your cities. And those are the balancing act that these board members had to do. That's why they came out with a quarter cent sales tax. And 70% said, go for it. And you know, they're not using the train. Many people, many of our cities, have n they're not anywhere near the train. I can tell you there are towns that they are 30, 40 miles away from the nearest train. They voted for it because they thought it was a big picture. It was the right thing to do. And I'm sure you have the same situation. I, and my last question would be, um, and it's actually related to doing nothing. Uh, <coughs> we do have to do something. And so whether or not, you know, it's, it's worth it. So um, transparency was brought up in one of the questions. Uh, I think it's real important people know what they're getting. It's not gonna. It's not perfect. There's not one solution. You can widen the widen the highway. That's not gonna solve it. You can have uh, rail and and everything. That's not gonna solve pro some of the problems we have. But uh, uh, it, it's uh, <coughs> the transparency and everything. When you're actually talking to the public, how transparent were you and how? How many people, how many workshops did you have? How many neighborhood meetings did you have? And things if like you that? don't mind, I have uh, my chair answer it because I was on the opposite side. I was at the county. We were not part of SMART, and they went through the hard part I'm of like selling it. like a lot it. of people. I don't mind paying for something, but I don't like the small print sometimes. Well, when you said how many workshops and community meetings, I rolled my eyes because I can't even count. There were so many, I can't even count. And what we did in the second, I was involved with both the, the first and the second um, sales tax measures was groups came together because they really wanted it to pass the second time. So what, what, what made it successful was getting a cross section of the whole community of both counties to work together. So we had labor unions, environmental organizations working together for the first time with business, untrusted business organizations in the North Bay, North Bay Labor Council, the environmentalists had never trusted them. They became co-chairs of the committee to start going out into the public. There were community meetings everywhere. There were neighborhood meetings. They all got together and coordinated a big, um, we didn't, we couldn't run the campaign ourselves. They did um, precinct walking for months. Um, there were meetings in every city council. I mean, I can't even count hundreds. And so it was a big group effort the second time, and, and so we still continue all that, and the cities still get together and work. You know, our board is, is really similar to yours. We have three supervi two supervisors from each county, three city council members from each county, then somebody, and then two from the Golden Gate Bridge District. And so, um, anyway, we, we all work together, and we're reaching out into our own areas, including Napa County, who has a seat, and Mendocino County who have a seat, and the train doesn't go to either place. 
So they were all working together because it's a, like Farhad said, it's a big vision that really mm -hmm. encompasses everybody. But I couldn't even count the number of meetings and, and that we did. Um, I'll just have a couple questions. I appreciate your remarks about uh, 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 reaching out and building a big coalition. We found here in Santa Cruz that when we actually all work together, we can accomplish a lot of our transportation uh, goals or uh, and build the political support to be able to pass funding measures. Um, uh, I wonder if you could uh, say something about quiet zones. Uh, in the past here in Santa Cruz, when there's been uh, excursion service, um, there's been loud horns and, and um, been very disruptive to the community, and it still gets talked about every time. What do you do about that in, uh, in, on SMART? So federal regulations, FRA, requires a train to blow their horn quarter mile before they get to a crossing and continues through the crossing until they get to the other side. Local agencies, cities and counties, can go through a process whereby adding additional safety measures, meaning more gates, berm, and other things that FRA and California Public Utilities Commission in a field meeting with you will dictate by adding those features at your grade crossings, then the train will be required not to blow their horn with an exception of emergencies. In Marin County, we have entire county's quiet zone. In Sonoma County, <coughs> almost 80 some percent of the county is quiet zone. The parts that are not was really a bureaucratic mess that whoever did the paperwork and the application left this one out and we're now cleaning up. And so for us, we have quiet zone. You need to address that during your early design stage and you need to reach an agreement with your jurisdictions about liability and about the cost. In our case, we spend $10 million of smart money to make all of our 63 grade crossings quiet zone ready. I took a policy to my board and said, you either can wait till we go operational, have everybody scream at us then, and go back and reconstruct, or we can assume they're gonna scream, and let's assume they're gonna ask for quiet zone sometime in the future, and therefore let's do it at the beginning, get it over with. Their direction to me was get it over with, and that's what we built. So those are some of those items that during your preliminary you need to address. Um, one of the other, uh, I thank you for the answer. Uh, one of the other uh, questions that often gets raised here as we think about a trail next to the rail line is uh, safety and aesthetics. Um, that we're gonna have uh, some ugly fencing or you know, some kind of fencing that, that'll, be, that'll ruin uh, our coastal communities. Um, and there's a question of who would wanna ride uh, next to when a train's coming by. Um, what, how do you separate the, the, um, the train uh, and, the, uh, and the trail and do you have bike riders on, on the trail that you have? Yes, we have tremendous amount of bike riders. We separate them where we have room, as much as 15 feet. The reason we put a fence is to prevent um, people who are not a biker or a train and simply want to trespass, um, and also um, children. So the fence is a security fence. Uh, if you put the right fence and the right color, you won't even see it a week later because it blends in. Um, if you're, you know, federal regulations and your own safety regulation, you don't want, remember when you're building a bike path, you're not building it for this professional person who knows what they're doing. That bike path also can have Johnny, the seven year old, who's in her first week of bike and is using that. So you have to have safety measures. And that distance is what we use. So when we have 15 feet, when we don't, as many feet as we can. But separate, we separate them by a fence for safety reasons, up both. And I think I saw some pictures in your presentation that, that they're like 42 inches high or something. Correct. And they did seem to blend in, at least when I was looking at them. Um, the uh, you've now been at this for a while uh we've been talking about it for a number of years 
how have you, what, what do you see about the funding? Do you see changes in funding that have taken place at the state level or the federal level? When we started, state had no money to give us. They had the traditional step that you all go through and it's so little and you, by the time you divide it between your cities and county, you know, you as an MPO get $10 to figure out what to do. Thanks to SB1, uh, state now, frankly, has more money than federal government. Right now, we're not doing well with the federal government. We're the wrong state and the wrong Bay Area and all the wrong projects. <laughs> Although I have to kiss up to Washington, D.C., because we got 21 million, so I am officially kissing up. Um, <laughs> but the fact is, state of California right now has tremendous amount of money and they are very good at distributing it. The current Secretary of Transportation, um, I'm sure Kelly knows this, but he's just on the Caltrans side, but on the rail side and everything else side, they're really stepping up and helping you. They won't step up and help you when you're fighting. They will step up and help you when you have a plan and commitment to do something. And more united front, the more opportunity. I brought the secretary, um, he came with his entire entourage and they looked at our operation facility and he said, how long did it take you from beginning to end? And I said, 48 months. And they said, that's the kind of project we wanna put money in. So the, the future is bright. Now there is a gas tax repeal, as you know that it's going on. I think Californians are much smarter than falling for that because for the first time we now have five billion dollars a year that our Secretary of Transportation can spend on us, on our infrastructure. And the money is protected. In June we passed Proposition 69, Nine. correct? Yeah. Which protects that money and cannot go anywhere else. So. Um, state and federal through your congressional, your senator, assembly member, start getting them involved and you'll see they tell you, fine, show us a united front. That has been the success story for us. Um, uh, the last question I'll ask is, uh, uh, the, you know, you have very impressive numbers for your first year of operation. Uh, how has the fires affected that ridership? Huge, uh, huge. Um, we lost 6,000 homes. And they were the type of homes that were the type of riders that we were carrying. They were the school teachers and the firefighters and the government employees. There were no high-end homes. There were some. but And our ridership was going steadily up when we opened from August, October 10th, big dive. Two weeks, um, the whole county was burning. Some of our stations, we couldn't operate because there were no water or PG&E. Mm -hmm which my board declared free service during that time, and we were just moving people. And it has now bounced back, and it has gone beyond when we started. So I think the 600,000, we took a big jolt. I don't want to jinx it, but I think next year it'd be much higher. Okay. And as we're adding more service, and as we go to Larkspur. And as those, those houses get rebuilt. Correct. Yeah. Well, uh, I think uh, Mr. Rockin had a, had a follow-up question. I just want to thank you for uh, the, your comments. So this is a quick question, but sure. you mentioned that you're, I understand that fare recovery is not the way you run a system, any public transport, any, in fact, even private transportation system. But you, you say you have 12 to 13 percent is your recovery rate. The transit district board that I serve on, we get in most transit districts around the country between 19 and 24 percent. Have you found problems with funders? Uh, I mean, they want, they want local support in order to, to match what they're, they're doing, but have you had people tell you you should have a higher percentage of recovery? And there's that choice the board made about what you wanted the fares to be. Is that in any way limited by a concern that if you have too low a recovery rate, agencies are gonna tell you, we won't give you any money because the, the riders themselves just don't pay enough? You, you know, excellent question. The way we looked at it is we're a brand new service. We're like a brand new business. You open your doors, and if you're serving a $100 lunch, who's going to come? My board wanted to make sure that people come and try us and then feel like, yeah, I can do this. So that was number one. Number two, we have a lot of people who are workers 
who are going long distances. And when you do zone, we didn't want them to pay twenty, thirty dollars round trip. It just, you know, the board, you know, they're all local. They have their feeling on what is happening. Um, so it was my task to deal with those agencies, and I continue having those arguments. So I think for next 10 years, I'm going to say we're brand new, so we're still trying to figure out. Because we want to keep, frankly, I, my board wants to keep the rates low because we're already getting paid sales tax. You know what so the they're already paying that. Now, you know, if you ask me, I think they should be free. Do you know um, what the national, what the recovery rate for rail is versus what it is for buses? Mm -hmm. by any chance? I have, I no, have idea. no. The reason is, you're, you know, we're brand new. Every 10, 15 years, there is a new rail agency created in America. So we're very unique. The big agencies, they're in the 60, 70, but they're in their 40 year and 50 year. You look at BART, BART has been doing this in for 40 years, and they're still figuring out, do I have a parking or not? You see what I mean? So it's an evolving, evolving for us. Uh, one of the items, my board will have that discussion because they told me, come back after a year and look at what we charge and what others charge. And my guess is they're going to continue with their philosophy of we want to make the train something that our teachers can afford. Thanks again. Uh, yeah. really. That's my well, guess. Uh I want to. I'm going to ask the commissioners to hold any additional questions, so we can actually get to the public to hear some comments uh, fr from them. I had a question, though. Can we can we defer that? And let, I, you know, it's almost twenty to twelve, and we have another presentation, right? Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure if uh, uh, Mr. Mansourin and Ms. Fudge have to leave. Yeah. So I. Uh, I'll be happy to stay since what is it million dollar speaking fee today? Yes, so for another million, so it'd be two million. That's where it goes to the fare box recovery, just so you know. I'll be happy to so stay. So we, we, when wish. Mr. Dondero and I talked about this, we were trying to figure out whether we should have both presentations and do one uh, uh, series of comments, as you're suggesting. And we're trying, we were trying to figure out how to balance so we didn't confuse all the, all the questions, because we're not going to have people come up and ask a question and have Mr. For, uh, Mr. Mansourin answer it. You know, we're going to try to take them all. Um, yeah, but we're an hour and 45 minutes into his presentation. It doesn't look really, yeah. it leaves about 20 minutes for the next presentation. Do you, do you want to uh, expedite the? Uh, get a sense. What? Yeah, how many people want to uh, uh, ask questions or make comments? Raise them really high. One, two, three, four, five, six, six. So I, I, I how many people? Seven, eight, ten people at the most. That we're, we're gonna get, we're gonna do ten people. We're gonna give you a minute uh, to 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 ask questions or make a comment. Uh, but please come forward, and if you could line up, that would also be helpful. It actually was seven. I counted, but I assume there's three. Hi, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm yeah. Stanley Soclo again. I just have a quick observation, back of the envelope kind of calculation for Mr. Caput. I, I haven't looked at it in a long time, but the IRS has a figure how much you can deduct for, op, for trips you take in your car, you know, for medical trips or whatever, uh, which last time I looked at it was a little over 50 cents a mile. So if you do a quick calculation, 20 miles commute from Watsonville to Santa Cruz, 50 cents a mile. 54 cents. It's 54 now. Okay, let's just say 50. So that's about $10 a trip. Make it a round trip. It's twenty dollars a day, five days a week. It's a hundred dollars a week. So for a month, it's there are four point three weeks in a month. So that's uh, four hundred thirty dollars a month for operating your car to commute during work. Uh, the smart monthly pass was only two hundred dollars. So it's way cheaper. So for the low income people, they're better off even though it sounds like it's an expensive fare. Nancy Pilicic, Watsonville City Council. I just want to say this gives me hope. I, am, I was so ecstatic to hear this. I didn't know if I was going to be able to make it here. I'm glad I did, and I think they've done an excellent job, and we have hope for the future. This is a great plan, and it's something we can implement here. We'll have to figure it out, but we can do it. Thank you. 
And I would just want to recognize that there have been five uh, council members here, at least that I've count counted. So, or, uh, so that's very impressive that Watsonville cares so much about this. Thank you. <coughs> Hello, I'm Greg Becker from south of La Selva. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mansourian, for coming down. My question to you is, how have you reacted to the LBG, uh, LPG tank cars uh, adjacent to your tracks? And if SB 1029 will mitigate that. Thank you. Um, Manu Koenig, City of Santa Cruz. I guess we'll just direct questions to you, and maybe they'll make it back to Mr. Monsurin at some point. That's the plan, I think. Yeah. All right, then. Um, I've got uh, six questions here. The first. Is there any way you could do this without passing the quarter cent sales tax? Would the state give you funds without that sales tax um, from SB1? Two, what is the cost of a single train set? Um, I believe it's around $7 million for a two-car train set. I was uh, based on some numbers on Wikipedia. Um, but so the cost of a single train set and then the capacity of that train set. Uh, Commissioner Rockin was good to point out the cost of an electric bus, so I'd like to know the comparable for the train set. Uh, three, uh, what is the max capacity of the entire system? Um, we hear that there's uh, great demand for increased capacity later hours. Um, given that it's a s s um, single track with four, s was that all me? Yeah, we were only given a minute. Oh, got it. Um, and could you do this with 30% of the population? Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. Steve Trujillo, candidate for Nancy's seat, actually, uh, running for city council. The important part of all this is if you want to get newcomers, new customers, new clients, you have to keep the price down. Remember, a uh, survey came out, KSBW just mentioned, Santa Cruz, second greatest county, the second... Second worst county for poverty in California, after LA County. We also have to recognize that no, most people in Watsonville aren't rich. <laughs> Marin County has a lot more money than we do. Nonetheless, we need to do, we need to pass the quarter cent sales tax and we need to do something similar to this because widening Highway 1 is not an option. And we need both rail and trail to start the Re Watsonville Renaissance. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Mark Masidi Miller, Santa Cruz. I just have a few quick questions for Farhad. Uh, what is the average length miles traveled a rider travels on SMART? Number two, have you met or exceeded your goals for ridership and for revenue? Uh, you, you know, you've painted a pretty rosy picture. What, what are the three biggest, most common complaints SMART receives? And, you know, are there other ways to fund train systems than sales taxes? Thank you. Robert Stevens, Aptos, and I wanted to say I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed hearing about SMART. I'm a big supporter of trains, but I think you have to use the right tool and the right application, and I'm not sure our county population warrants this. And the one question I have is I believe your ridership per train is about 88 people if you divide 3,000 by 34, and I just want to verify that that's correct, about 88 people per train. I just would like to go back to the um, thing that we opened with. I think it's appropriate that this series began with um, Jarrett Walker, who put that lens on this about freedom and opportunity. And my question is, we did hear about the smart train being comfortable for those who can afford to ride it. Certainly, if you can afford a cup of coffee, a beer, a glass of wine, it's lovely. I've been on it. It's a great ride, but it's helping a very small um, portion of the population. I'd like to know what the demographics of that population is beyond kind of the hypothetical stories we heard this morning, and I don't know that those answers are here today. But I would like to know how this train in Santa Cruz County would create new freedom and opportunity for the people who need it most. Because quite honestly, it doesn't sound like it would. And while a big infrastructure project is something that 
a public agency really likes, and while building a train may employ people for a certain amount of time, if it's not a long-term solution, it's really not where we should be thinking. Thank you. Michael, St. Aptos, a quick question that came up last night. Um, which way do you think was best? Uh, you guys have taken on the whole operation of this as a, basically an RTC type situation, or is it better the way we br we're doing it, bringing in an operator as uh, progressive rail? Thank you. Uh, just another question. If you were a kid working at the boardwalk and you lived in Watsonville, would you rather pay two bucks to get on the metro to get up to work, or would you rather pay uh, 23 bucks or whatever number that they're talking about. Good morning again, Lowell Hurst, Mayor of Watsonville. I was one of the lucky people that got to ride the smart train, and I don't, I'm not saying it's going to work here or not going to work here, but one of the things that was remarkable to me was that I visited with grandmothers and senior citizens on the train, and they unanimously said I couldn't go see my uh, grandkids if it wasn't for this train. I wouldn't be able to see my relatives because I can't afford to uh, live uh, close to the city. And I also sat next to a developmentally disabled adult on the train who worked, who had a job, uh, but lived in a group home. And he said he would not be able, as a handicapped individual, he would not be able to uh, hold a job or visit his friends or even have a social life if it wasn't for the smart train. And so those are just two practical applications that I saw personally. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hernandez, I think you're going to be the last speaker on this. We only have one minute. I prepared seven minutes of just kidding. <laughs> The person sitting next to you will, will appreciate the other six. <laughs> you know, there's a, you know, every time I uh, talk to folks here in Watsonville, you know, they tell me that they work in Santa Cruz and different areas in Capitola, a lot of young people. You know, it was mentioned before about Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. I got two nieces that actually work there from different sides of the family that actually work there, and I just sold one of them my old car so that they can get to work from Watsonville to the boardwalk. It's one more car that's gonna be added on the freeway. Um, I've talked to different workers from different places like Santa Cruz Nutritionals. They, they say about 60% of their workforce is from Watsonville, uh, women that worked in the canneries here before in districts one and two. Uh, people that work in the county buildings, both Ocean Street, Emmeline, a lot of employees here in Watsonville from UC Santa Cruz. You see about 20 vans, Dominican Hospital, and not to mention every single restaurant that's in Santa Cruz. The majority of the people that work as busboys, dishwashers, yeah. line cooks are predominantly from Watsonville mm -mm. and every hotel as well. Thank not you. to mention 2,000 cars, less greenhouse gas. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to cut you off. Um, so uh, I appreciate the comments. Uh, we're gonna, we we want to move on to our next presentation. Uh, uh, I want to uh, also just thank uh, Mayor Fudge uh, for being here. Uh, I appreciate someone with local knowledge um, and the leadership skills that you've clearly shown in Windsor um, have been a strong advocate for this. And, and hearing uh, your perspective even briefly here is, is helpful. You and I have had a chance to talk before. Um, and enjoy the rest of your stay here in Santa Cruz. John, could we ask that the, the questions, since there, we'll have them on tape, could, could we have them answered possibly on our website so the people who ask those questions? I mean, there were a couple of very concrete and specific questions as opposed to comments. We'll figure out at the end of the meeting how we're going to answer the questions, okay. all right, if, if, if that works out. Um, we, do have a, we do have a second presentation uh, today, uh, which is uh, from the city manager of Kirkland, Washington, uh, Kirk Triplett, uh, Mr. Dondero. Yes, um, I'll keep this very brief. Um, Mr. Triplett's going to talk to you about the Cross Kirkland Corridor, or CKC, um, and has an interim trail, uh, which is a 10-foot wide, 5.75 mile uh, crushed gravel trail that runs um, from the South Kirkland Park and ride through the Totem Lake Business District. And um, I'm going to let I'm going to let Kurt 
do the rest. I, I know he's, he's, he's well prepared. We talked earlier this morning, so I'm not going to take up any more of his time. Thank you. Good morning. I need to press. So I have about a 25-minute presentation. I just want to make sure, does that still work for the, yes. for the commission? Um, wonderful opportunity to be here and watch. I just want to say I want to compliment everybody's passion because it really comes from a commitment to making a better community. So whatever side of the issues you are on, everyone is really trying to make their community a better place. It's neat for me to come down and see all that. Um, I have about a 25-minute presentation here, and my goal is not necessarily to give you any advice, but to tell you some things that we experienced when we went through a similar process, and many of the issues I heard are similar, <laughs> and maybe give you some food for thought um, as you look forward and try to grapple with what you might do. So starting off, this was actually a grand opening of the interim trail. It happened in January of 2015, and it was when the Seahawks were their third consecutive year after they'd been to two Super Bowls. And just after we opened it, they lost to Carolina Panthers. But <laughs> it did create a lot of fun people in Seahawks uniforms when we, when we cut the opening. Um, what I want to do is give a very brief uh, history of the Cross Kirkland Corridor. Um, one issue I didn't see a lot as I had a chance to look at your website was the issue of economic development, which I know got raised. And so I want to talk about how that has played out in a way we had no idea would happen when we opened up our corridor. I want to talk about some of the connections we were able to create with our interim trail strategy. I want to talk about our tangle over transit. We had a huge fight that didn't go well for our community on transit. And then I want to share with you some things I think might help as you seek ways to really create community and not conflict as you look to the future of your corridor. Um, I also had a handout that I just gave everybody. There's some there as well that has a lot more information. Um, in the transparency issue, this was actually a handout we made in 2015. And I kept it here because you can see it has a light rail train featured front and center. And our story has evolved considerably, but I want to show we started off with this idea that we wanted rail on our corridor. And I think like the uh, armadillo's dead in the middle of the road, I'm sort of halfway between everything here. There's probably a lot in this presentation that everyone will be unhappy with. So, <laughs> Welcome to our world. Yes. Uh, so our corridor is, is somewhat unique. It's also a, a rail corridor. Um, it's actually a rail banked corridor. It's actually owned by quite a few different entities. And you can actually see the breakout up here. It's about 41 miles. Uh, the top northern 12 miles are actually ac active freight operation. Uh, the rest of it is now being converted in various ways to different trails. Uh, you can see the Kirkland piece is that light green piece, 5.75 miles, sort of in the center of what we call the main line. Uh, this was actually purchased in 2009 from Burlington Northern by a, a coalition of governments. And you can actually see me when I had hair in that photo. At that time, I was actually the interim county executive, and I was part of the group that actually bought this corridor. The original partners, you can see there, that purchased the corridor, right after we bought the corridor, the Port of Seattle purchased the corridor from Burlington Northern. And the goal was they bought it for $82 million. Everyone else was supposed to pay them back. And not really cause and effect, but shortly after was no longer the interim executive, which was a choice I made. I didn't want to continue to be the executive. But the new executive was elected. They took the $26 million that the county had set aside and used it to buy a gravel pit. So after that, the Cascade Water Alliance also pulled out. So the port found itself in this very interesting spot of about $40 million of the promised money from several of the jurisdictions was no longer there. So they went to everyone and said, who wants to buy a piece of the corridor? <laughs> so um, I had fortunately moved from the county at that time to become Kirkland City Manager. And I went to my council and said, we have to buy this corridor. And one of the things I want to compliment this body on is the fact that you got it. I spent a lot of time telling groups, if you have a chance to buy a real corridor, buy it. <laughs> Even if you don't know what you want to do with it, you got to buy it. So just tremendous compliments to you that you have it, you're planning for it, um, you're already way ahead of the game. But as you can see, for Kirkland, this goes north-south through our entire city. It was an old abandoned railroad track, and it's next to just about everything, schools, businesses, uh, the community, access to the waterfront, and the track at the time really cut the city in half. It was really a canyon. It was wonderful to follow SMART because SMART was actually our, our inspiration when we started. Hey, people are thinking about transit and trails, and we used this visual multiple times, and this is actually 
from one of my 2012 presentations. So I wanted to sort of be fair <laughs> that this was what we started showing people when we first started talking about trail and transit. But the two things I really want to emphasize were the vision statements we came up with Kirkland, which was the first was that planning or implementing one mode, whether it be trail or transit, should not foreclose future use by another mode. And that was really critical to our decision to do an interim trail. So when we took out the tracks, we knew that if something like SMART had to be built, those tracks were no good anyway. They would have had to have been replaced, which is what you saw in the presentation he had. But we also had a lot of people who said, pave it. Pave it right now. And we said, yeah, once you do that, it's really hard to bring something else back on. So we chose not to pave it, but we did choose to take out the tracks. Um, and what you can also see, though, is one of the key things was this was going to be one of the ways we connected our community to the region, both in transit and bike pads. So this is just a, a very brief history. And the two key ones are we bought the corridor in 2011. For $5.2 million, that was our section. And we opened it in January of 2015. And you can just see the, sort of the evolution as we took out the tracks and put in the interim trail. So what happened next is a really uh, wonderful story because it has really truly transformed our community and brought economic development on a scale that we never imagined when we first bought the corridor. Uh, this is the one slide I'm going to spend a little bit of time on and the rest go fairly quickly. But when I was hired as a city manager, as well, those of you who have city managers know, you go to your bosses and you say, what do you want me to do? And they said, we have this old dilapidated mall up in the north. You have to revitalize it. And we have this little company called Google that's just getting started. And they have a headquarters here, about 1,000 people. You got to keep them here. And if you can figure out how to get them to expand, you should do that too. So those are my two tasks. It had nothing to do with the corridor. We brought in the Urban Land Institute, which some of you may be familiar with, a uh, nationally organized group, and we said, give us insights. How is our zoning? How is our land use? What can we do? And they went and they toured the mall, and you can see on the top there we have a lake, and we had where the corridor was. And they said, wow, what you really need to do is you really need to turn that lake into a park, and you need to buy this corridor thing, and you need to open it up as a trail. And if you do that, you're going to catalyze economic growth and housing and uh, walkability. When I met with the Google executives and said, what do you need to stay here? What was fascinating is they said, we want to park on the other side of that railroad track. <laughs> That's all we want. We don't have enough parking for our place. And there was a big giant open space over there. And they said, and Burlington Northern won't let us drive across it. So we'd like you to buy that corner so we could drive, our place could drive and park over on the other side of that. I was like, That's it? That's all you want? Yeah, that's all we want. So I had the Urban Land Institute and I had Google saying, hey, you should really think about this differently. You should think about this as an economic development tool, not just as a trail and transportation tool. And so when we did our master plan, we began to really incorporate that thinking. And one of our commissioners said, this corridor needs to be a place to go to, not just a place to go through. And I think that might be something you want to ponder as you get to your next steps. Like, how can you use this to actually create community and not just create transportation. Uh, we had four major goals, connect Kirkland, which is of course the transportation piece. And again, you can see light rail, it was in the very first master plan we had. Uh, but then we started talking about things like a greener Kirkland and greenhouse gas emissions and um, ways to make it the greenest corridor in America is what we decided we wanted to try for. And how do we activate it and evolve over time? How do we turn it into an economic development tool? And it worked. So this is actually Google phase two, the building you see on the lower left. We let them drive over and park, and they said, we like this space so much, we want to build a lead platinum building for another 1,200 employees. Can we do that? Yeah, OK, we can let you do that. <laughs> so not only did they do that, but what they actually said is, now this big space that we have between where those tracks used to be, could we just turn that into a park for you? <laughs> because our employees really want to get out on this thing. And so what we said as well, we have this master plan. If you're actually willing to implement the version of the master plan between the two buildings, we'll let you do that. So this aerial is taken from a drone. You can actually see where, I don't know if this has a pointer, uh, where you see that paved concrete is actually where the old railroad tracks used to be. So Google, on their own, came to us and invested $3 million to build uh, basically a linear park, and then they gave it to us because it was public land, so I wouldn't let them have the land. But, and then they built a, uh, 
bridge across it that connects the two buildings. At the same time, what we did is we said, can we think differently about our, our land use planning around the corridor? And we came up with what we called trail-oriented development. And so we actually revamped all of our um, development regulations and said we need to encourage things like wineries and uh, breweries and coffee roasteries or places where people can make things and then sell them, so like glass blowing and those kinds of things. So how do you help an industrial area convert from being a warehouse district to being something that's much more active? And we actually now have three breweries that have developed along the corridor, and people bike to them, spend a while, and then hopefully they get a different way home. But <laughs> so far we have had no incidents with the people uh, biking to the breweries. And this is that mall. This is the former mall. So after we actually developed a master plan for the park, I'm going to go back to that slide in a second, what we did is we actually took that uh, old park with the corridor and we did a master plan and we've invested about $9 million in developing this park. It's not finished yet, but it has a bridge that goes over the roads and links to the corridor. When we bought the corridor and we designed the park, we took that to the mall owners and we said, this is the public investment we're making will you guys match this? And they turned around and they actually sold this to a new developer, Center Cal. Center Cal came in with a complete re-envisioning of the whole community, and they've actually built that whole first building you see on the lower half, and they're almost finished with the second half. But there's going to be um, almost 1,000 units. There's um, almost 100,000 <coughs> um, square feet of retail. There's about another 200,000 square feet of office. There's a, a uh, sit on all sorts of things going on there, and it's had all sorts of things not happening around it. We have almost 4,000 units developing around the mall because this is happening. And one of the key reasons it happened was because we bought the corridor and because we designed the park and showed them how they all worked together. These, to when you say units, you mean housing community. units you're talking I'm about? I'm sorry? These are housing units you're talking about? Yeah, when they're okay. done, there'll be 850 housing units here. Um, the surrounding neighborhood is going to have about 4,000 when they're finished. And then our master plan tries to take this whole idea of transforming the community much further. Um, so we built into these, like, we haven't had a chance to actualize any of these yet, but in the final plan, like you saw in the Google segment, we're going to have eddies where people can stop and rest and work on laptops. Uh, we've already begun to use this for festivals. It's like a linear festival street. We have a group that does a Crossing Kirkland event every year where we have food trucks and stations and things. And so we're already getting people using it in a totally different way than just biking and walking. Uh, we have a vision of art. We've already had several wonderful murals that have been painted along the corridor, and we have people who want to bring in uh, ephemeral art, and we also have folks who want to bring in statues and things, so we're going to have a huge art component to this. We want to fill it with light, so that's interesting both in the daytime and the nighttime, and we've put this already in a couple of our locations. And then when that whole greener corridor in America thing, we also want to use this to create urban water uh, system management, so stormwater management, and also give people a way to interact with and touch the environment. So all of those things are things we're trying to build in that sort of help create that transformation, not just this idea that a corridor like this can only be a trail or a transit corridor. And so how has the interim strategy worked? It's worked actually far beyond anything that we actually imagined. More people use this thing the second you take the tracks out than you can possibly imagine. So just a couple quick slides here that show the before and after. When we, what we had when it was first tracks in 2012, looks very similar to some of the things I saw in Santa Cruz. I had a chance to tour some of this last night. Uh, you can see we turned really dangerous intersections to much more safer pedestrian and bike crossings. Uh, part of our environmental commitment is all these are solar powered flashing beacons and all the pavement is pervious pavement. Uh, we had a whole host of logs and planks and things going across drainage ditches to get to the railroad tracks. We replaced those with true paths and little bridges. We had all kinds of communities coming to us saying, how can we connect to this thing? Because it used to be, it's either a big berm on the top or it's a big ditch down below. And so we created all kinds of little neighborhood grant programs. And we got work parties out and people built these things like these stairways with um, uh, ability to roll your bike up there. And so it's created an opportunity to access this spine through the corridor, through the city of Kirkland that we didn't ever have before. And we have thousands of people using it now. Um, there's also amazing views on this corridor. The Kirkland kind of slopes down to the water, and because train tracks have to be flat, you know, there's a flat corridor all the way through, and so you have these great views over the tops of houses. Um, and before, when it was just a track, no one really got to use that. The only people who really got it were the houses above it. Now we have thousands of people who get that view as they go by it every day. And then a safety issue. 
we had lots of places that when it was track felt very unsafe. We had issues of homelessness and other challenges. Uh, this is a place we call the Highlands Pass. When we put in the interim trail and activated it, this section became people's refuge. More and more people want to go to this section because it's just so pretty. And it's something that you don't really find in an urban area. It's like you feel like you're in the middle of nowhere. And people walk their bikes, they walk dogs. We have all sorts of multi-generational use, kids, grandparents. It's, it's been pretty extraordinary. So, so far, nothing but Everybody knew <laughs> that transit was coming. So what happened? Everything went to heck. <laughs> it went to heck faster than you could possibly imagine. So we opened the corridor in January of 2015. This conversation started in January of 2016, a year later. You would have thought we had an interim trail for the last 20 decades. People were like, we cannot give up this corridor that we've had for so many years. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Uh, I was at a meeting where we, we had it in our community center. I had 400 people turn out to tell us that transit on the corridor was the exact wrong thing for the city to do. But we worked through that. We had a lot of conversations about that. That was one of my uh, less exciting times of being a city manager. <laughs> um, our council, though, really stepped up and really stayed committed to the vision of transit on the corridor. And what happened was we got this really interesting rock and a hard place thing where our council was firmly committed to the vision of trail and transit. Our community was saying, don't put buses on the corridor, don't put trains on the corridor, you can't possibly do this. And the saveourtrail.org was a group that formed immediately. They turned out by the hundreds at that meeting, probably 70 to 100 of them showed up at every city council meeting for six months wearing green shirts. Uh, lots of lively testimony. It was, it was a good old time. We then came up with this idea of buses on the corridor. And we thought it would be a cheaper, more effective uh, way to provide service, and that our corridor wasn't really right for light rail. And we tried to talk to our transit agency about that. We said, hey, have we got a great idea for you. You guys want to put a $1.5 billion light rail line down this corridor. We have a $500 million bus vision that's actually as effective and a whole lot cheaper. Why don't we do that? Meanwhile, all the people in the back were saying, no buses, no buses, no buses. Our regional entity said, we don't do buses. We do light rail. We literally had a conversation where they said, it's light rail or nothing. So we are caught right in the middle of this. Is it a train? Is it transit? Is it nothing? Our council actually said, then right now, it's nothing. Right? So very, very brave stance for them to take. And what actually happened is that 2016 ballot measure did not include any investments of transit along the cross Crooklyn corridor. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit, about why I still think that's better for our community. But this was because we were in a mode battle. It was either light rail or nothing. It was tracks or nothing. And that's, I think, something that we have an opportunity to maybe share some lessons learned uh, with your community. So what would those be? What If I could go back and do it all over again, <laughs> what would I have done? Well, we really spent a lot of time afterward talking to people about outcomes. And, you know, the terms opponents, I heard a lot, you know, people come up and, and believe me, I've been on the other side of this. People get visceral, they get personal. It's, um, it's disappointing on all sides when people choose to go that way. And if people can just set the outrage aside and you can have facilitated discussions with people to talk about what outcomes are you trying to achieve? What are you afraid of? What do you want to see? And so we worked through all that. And when we actually could get people to sit down and say, what are you afraid of about a train, right? So Sound Transit, you know, being very transparent, you know, they have had accidents. And so people are saying the safety of having a light rail train coming through our suburban community is huge. 
Um, you saw that beautiful view section that I showed you. People didn't want to see 30-foot high catenary lines going all the way down the corridor. Uh, probably one of the biggest things, and uh, it was referred to when you talk about creating the quiet zone, the investment you have to make to keep a quiet zone safe really does divide the community again. It's great for the trains, but it creates a huge infrastructure that sort of creates a barrier from people, in our opinion, going east-west. So this whole canyon effect, a reestablishing of, of a barrier down the community was something that people were really, really upset about. And when we talked to them about buses, all they could envision was you want to bring these buses from Asia that are going to blow black smoke and be really expensive and stink, and how would you do that? Why would you destroy our community with these horrible diesel buses? We're like, wow, <laughs> I haven't seen a diesel bus like that in 20 years in, in the Pacific Northwest. But, but that's what really we kept saying, great, this is good. Tell us, tell us, tell us. What is it? What is it? When we said, what do you want? You know, what is it that you would like to see? And transit kept coming back up. We want people to be able to commute on this corridor. Like, wow, that's not what you actually said three months ago. So, so transit started to reemerge, which was great when we had a chance to really talk with people. Uh, they wanted paved path, most importantly, and they wanted a shared path. They wanted, as they call them, the crazy bikers to have their own dedicated line over here, and they wanted the normal people to be, be able to be over here so they could bike with their kids or walk their dogs. And they said, if you're going to have buses, they better not make any noise and they better not have any emissions. So the shared outcomes we were able to develop through all this were, OK, we need a paved trail. It's got to be on a more human scale. We need an electric fleet. We need to have no rail um, in our particular segment. This all happened after the fact. And I'm, I'm sad about that, because we probably would have been more successful if we had thought this through and, and had more of those facilitate discussions ahead of time. But I think we actually now have a plan to be united if a Sound Transit 4 ever happens. Um, and I'm also I've been tasked by my council to think of ways that we can implement some of these things on a much smaller scale locally. So <laughs> what would I do different? What are possible things for, for this community to think about? Constant communication. We didn't do enough of that. If I could have done this again, I would have had a billboard every 100 feet saying, transit is coming, <laughs> transit is coming, transit is coming. When we opened the interim trail, we had an opportunity to do that, and we didn't because we thought everybody knew. It was just understood. And even two years later, you have the turnover in their population, or someone who never paid any attention, who now sees this wonderful interim trail that they're on, they can't even imagine where someone came up with the idea of transit. Right? So, so I think if you pick something, what you want to do is just make sure that's clearly communicated in a way that can't be avoided, so that people can't come and say, I wasn't part of this. I didn't know. Um, and if we had done that, I think that would have changed the conversation dramatically. Uh, you have an opportunity that we didn't have, which is disruptive technology is emerging all over the place right now. And some of it was referred to in our previous conversation. But this whole idea, idea of ACEs, which you guys are, are probably very familiar with, but the automated, connected, electric, and shared economies, they're going gangbusters. And they're just waiting for a corridor to be the first corridor that this happens on. Uh, what you can see in the, in the bottom, my left, is at Heathrow Airport. They already have these automated vehicles that drive people around. Um, King County Metro, which provides our service, actually has Proterra electric buses. So they've got a fleet of about 20 of them right now. So they no emissions, almost no sound. Google, which is in our headquarters, so I had to put the cute Google car in there, is obviously trying to make driverless cars everywhere. And almost every major auto company is right on the cusp of bringing um, automated vehicles. And there's lots of these little shuttle ideas out there. Uh, that everyone's using, whether it's at a university or an institution. All this stuff is happening right now. It's real. It's live technology. It can be used today. And the next thing that didn't exist a year ago that we're now grappling with is this whole idea of this sort of ACES concept going down the next level to bikes. So electric bikes, electric scooters, both for the shared economy, so a tourist can use it, or a person who just wants a one-off trip that day, they want to take it to, the, to catch on the bus, so they want to buy a commuter bike. They don't want to have to figure out how to put on Lycra. They don't want to have to fix a flat tire. Um, and the electric bikes themselves are now turning into true commuter vehicles. I mean, these things can now, some of them can go 30, 40, 50 miles an hour. Whether that's a good idea to have on your corridor, <laughs> you know, I don't know. But this didn't exist when we had our conversations in 2015 and 2016. And now it exists today and is getting more and more, and is creating more and more options. So this combination of the ACEs on the vehicle side and the ACEs on the bicycle side, I think, gives your community and I think all future communities a way to think differently about how you might approach transit on a corridor. And then I'm known up in the Northwest as the gondola guy. 
So I always like to bring out one thing that's actually old school technology is aerial tramway systems. And particularly for places like you where you have estuaries and rivers to cross and valleys and things to go over, um, fixed guideway technology might be really intriguing for you to evaluate, particularly for first and last mile connections. And a lot of times when I talk about this, people go, are you crazy? Who would do that? Well, Roosevelt Island Tramway has been in operation for decades. Um, the one on the top left is actually in downtown Portland. It goes from downtown Portland up to the Oregon State Health Sciences Building. Uh, the one with the yellow cars, this is actually becoming a huge transit technology in South America. And so this is actually a way that uh, those residents of their city get from the, the lower part of the city to the upper part. And then this uh, one on the far lower right is actually was open in London after, shortly after the London Olympics. So they're also using this now as a um, transit system. And for those of you who don't think this can happen here, I just took this yesterday <laughs> at the center of <laughs> Boardwalk. I was like, hey, it's a gondola. So, uh, so we sort of know and, and, and love these kind of technologies, but we don't yet think of them as a potential solution in our transportation world. And I think that's something the United States can do much better. So my last section as I go in um, is sort of the whole role of pilots. And I like to put up this slide that um, a few good pilots can change the world. And I think that's really true, especially in the public sector. We don't do enough of this. And I think corridors like this are exactly the place to try things. And so there is so much out there to try. I gave you a few things to talk But one of my favorites is the Chinese straddle bus, which is in the middle. <laughs> And if you Google Chinese straddle bus, you'll actually see a really cool video of this. And basically what they were experimenting with is this idea of putting a bus over an entire lane of traffic. So it just sails over the traffic back and forth. Oh. Um, <laughs> they have not built it yet, but it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Uh, the one on the bottom is the Cambridge Expressway, and they had a different way. They basically decided not to just pave over everything. And so the bus is actually running these little runnels. Um, but as I said, there's just a lot of stuff out there that's, that's happening that if you took segments of your corridor, and I'm trying to do this in Kirkland as well, and said, could we experiment with a few of these things? Um, so when we go back to our, using my own corridor as an example, when we go back to our shared outcomes, and I take the light rail off, and I say, what could I do with this transit platform? Right? There's my human scale. There's my separated, you know, this is the ultimate vision. But I could have a really great electric bus system. And I could put in an aerial tramway, which is actually what I'm trying to do. But uh, so far, I've not been successful. Um, this is my vision of how you could actually use a straddle bus and go straight down the center. And you could actually just ride over all of the bike users. Could we do this? I don't know. But it doesn't seem like it's spatially impossible to do, right? Uh, so just maybe trying to think differently. And then because I started with the Seahawk thing, I got to end with the Seahawk thing. So in 2013, when the Seahawks won the Super Bowl, our quarterback um, had started his group and said, why not us this year? And it became a mantra that maybe some of you heard about. But, but many of the members of the team credited Russell Wilson saying, why not us again and again and again throughout the year as the reason they won the Super Bowl in 2013. And one of the things I'd like to leave with you, and I, and I apply this to my own staff all the time, is, you know, why not you? Why not us to be the first place that you actually try transit in a different way? I absolutely believe you have to have transit on this corridor. There's no question about it. I think if it was just a trail, I don't think that would be sufficient. And I think that would be a waste of a precious corridor. But I think, given the way things are changing, you have a really interesting opportunity to experiment that not many people do. And what you get out of the experimentation option is, if you think about building rail in a different time scale, this is what we did. These current tracks have to come out in order to put something like smart in. But when they have to go back in, it's totally up to you, right? So you might want to consider you take them out for a bit. You can have an interim trail that gets you immediate use, but you could run something on it. What is that thing? I don't know. That would be up to your community. And if that doesn't work, you can always put the tracks back. I know there's lots of discussions about could that really happen, but it really depends on the elected leadership at that time. So why not you? Why not us? That's what I'm trying for. And so uh, that's just a sort of a recap of everything I talked about. And I'm very happy to answer questions and give you any thoughts from the Northwest. But thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much, Mr. Triplett. And I appreciate the, the, the conciseness of, of the information, but you gave us a lot of good stuff to think about. Now I'll turn to my colleagues to see if they have questions. Mr. Rockin. 
I was in, in thank you for your presentation, really helpful in a lot of ways. I, I was intrigued by your idea that, you know, maybe you should, uh, because the, the reaction to now that we have our uh, bicycle and pedestrian trail, we don't want it messed up with transit. Yep. And you said, you, you know, maybe we should have put billboards every 100 feet or something. How about leaving a track that tells people really clearly mm -hmm. that this is trans, even if you're not going to end up with train, even <clears> if eventually you're, certainly you will have to tear the track out even if you want train, as was pointed out by SMART. But even if you're going to go to buses or to like little vehicles, you know, uh, 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 personal rapid transit or other kinds of options, wouldn't it be smart, given what your experience has been, if you really want to have transit eventually and to like head off the, you're messing up our wonderful pristine trail, um, just to leave the tracks in as a very clear billboard message. Instead of spending money on a bunch of billboards, just leave a rusting old track that's not going anywhere. Well, wait, so I actually, I had a, I have a, sli a slip in here that talks about our cost-benefit analysis and what, what we spent on the interim trail. The reason we didn't choose to leave the tracks in, and we had that debate, and in fact, we explored things like, could you lay a cover over the top of the tracks? I mean, we actually costed that out, and it was a lot of money, but we talked about putting a temporary cover over it and having that be the interim trail and just leaving the tracks in for that very purpose. Um, you can't put the trail next to it very cheaply. The, the wonderful thing about the interim solution is it's cheap, it's cost effective, and it's quick. We did it really fast. And in fact, on the salvage parts of the ties and the rail, you actually make some money on the thing, right? So, so you can make an interim trail investment very quickly, and you don't have a lot of environmental hurdles to go through because you're not widening its footprint and you're not, you're not creating, uh, well, at least up in Washington, I don't know, it could be different here in California. But, so that idea of quick and cheap access to the corridor was really important, and we couldn't figure out a way to leave the tracks in and actually have a safe interim trail that wasn't extraordinarily costly. So if we could have actually built the full trail next to it first, we might have considered that. That was something we chose to do. As I said, because we didn't include any additional information with it, it was a mistake to just take out the tracks and put in the interim trail. Um, I will leave you with a message of hope. At that meeting that had 400 people, probably about 100 of them wanted transit. And in our follow-up conversations after the Sound Transit 3 ballot measure, um, everybody, even people who use the corridor, said, you know, now that we're thinking about it, this transit thing really does kind of make some idea. Can you think about ways to bring transit back? So if you can, if you can get out of <coughs> mode and get off of whether it's a train transit, but just transit, I think you can have a lot of success. But we did look at that. And different parts of that corridor made different decisions. You know, we were just our piece. King County left the, train in, the tracks in for that very reason. So they're just taking them out now, uh, five years later. Of course, it would depend on it would depend on which there's huge disagreement about. I'm not going to try and settle in this comment, right? But, you know, right. whether you have a adequate width to, to build the trail with right. all the tracks still there and so forth, right. which people exactly. disagree about within in the county. And it varies community to community for sure. Thanks for that response. It's helpful, uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair. So, um, thanks for coming. It's uh, to me that was an excellent presentation, just from the standpoint that. Um, it embraces the future, and it also deals with possibility thinking that not, doesn't exclude anybody. You're open to transit. Your people, your, your council, your community was that way. I believe Kirkland has about 90,000 people. Right. And it's right. next to Redmond and Correct. Right. part of the Seattle community. Um, and you have a much uh, bigger population base. But what's interesting to me is that you saw within the, the time frame of a year, new um, things coming on the market, whether they were scooters, whether they were uh, 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 e-bikes and so forth, that uh, took a quantum leap in terms of ridership because now you can go 20 miles on a trail like this. Mm. Um, so um, my compliments just from the standpoint of, and, and when you know, um, I was a little skeptical of SMART, but the big thing for me is the cost involved. And you know, the, the, the issue with the cost of, of, a, of a train system is that you keep adding on to it, adding on to it, adding on to it, and then it becomes too big to fail. And so regardless of what the outcomes are, you still have to pay money on and on and on because you've just put in half a billion dollars and you're not gonna say goodbye to something like this. But this, is, this could be two, three, four, five million dollars and you know, if, if a transit solution comes, you can wash your hands of that investment and say, listen, we're moving on to something better. And it doesn't exclude the possibilities of you having a transit solution later on. Um, 
I, th I, th I thought it was a good presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Bertrand. So it's like, how do you solve a problem? And um, so my background's engineering, mm -hmm. the whole thing in the semiconductor field, and how do you solve a problem? It's understanding the different components. But when I was successful in understanding a problem and getting to a solution, it depended on how I parsed out that problem, how I understood what that problem was. Right. And it seems to me we're sort of caught in that here with a huge number of variables. That's our population and all the needs of the population. And the different people that have certain ideas that they feel will solve that problem. And that was spoken to earlier, individual from SMART. So my question is a little bit different here. Um, I don't think we'll get to that answer. <laughs> but it was pointed out that around 600,000 over the course of the time period that SMART was collecting these um, numbers were off the freeway, you know, coming and going, okay. And you were talking about the trail and how it sort of got the community to support it. So what I'm trying to understand maybe, or you could give me some insight, maybe you haven't actually counted the numbers, but ever since I've been actively involved in political organizing, it's my concept was building community. Since my 20s, it was building community, and there's different ways to get to that. I worked in community food stores and community um, events. Okay, how many people do you feel are being impacted by a trail that's going through a community you, you pointed out all these different projects, and we have some in Capitola. We built a stairway so we could get to a little trail. So, you know, like 200 feet long, <laughs> and people want to build a stairway, right? Amazing to me. So that's what I'm trying to get to. So building community, all the different things that came out, like the brew pubs that you talked about. So I'm wondering, can you give me an idea of the relative impact in terms of involving people in a regular community and what it meant to them. So so I would say there isn't a single part of the community that hasn't been positively impacted by the corridor. Now, I won't say that was true if we tried to put transit on it, but so I, I just want to say that was what was really surprising to all of us. Uh, everybody uses it for all sorts of different things, whether it's people who are just want to walk for their little segment. Um, my daughter's 13, she's um, in middle school, and she and her friends always meet on the Cross Crooked Corridor, and then they go off to whatever they want to do, the mall or something else. I mean, that's, that's become the meeting place for the kids who are like 15 and under. Um, we have lots of runs on it already. You know, basically every uh, foot race through Kirkland now has some segment of the corridor as part of, of the run, whether it's a half marathon or a, a 3K or a 5K. Um, people just use it all different ways and all different kinds. We have... Um, it's really opened up east-west. I think that that was the thing that we didn't really expect was how little people passed this corridor when it was a track because it was really a barrier. You could walk across it, you know, and you could even walk along it. And there were some, there were some hardcore people who did, right? But as soon as it became something you could actually come like this, it just completely connected the city in ways that no one could imagine. And it was one of the reasons we were so surprised by how much they loved it immediately. But I, I would say, honestly, it's the one thing I get the most credit for as a city manager, and I didn't do it. I mean, I helped buy it, but people love it. I mean, it's just, and they talk about it all the time, and it's really become a centerpiece of the community, and we never really expected that. We actually kept thinking of it really more as a transit corridor, and it's really become a, a part of the fabric of the community. One little follow-up. So in terms of the self-image of the community, has that sort of expanded its sense of self-image? It's, it's sort of like another aspect of the community that... You know, people say, like, I like to buy houses near a school. You know, it's yeah. sort of a yeah. one the, the second this opened, every real estate sign or flyer said, you know, X miles or X quarter miles or two blocks from the Cross Crook and Corridor. It instantly became the thing that you wanted to be by. Wow. Um, Google, part of the reason Google wanted to develop their section was all their employees kept saying, we want to run on this thing at lunch, you know. So the, the thousand people were sitting right there. They wanted access to it immediately. It was just... Uh, oh, the, the other biggest thing is actually school walk routes. This actually connects to four schools, and it actually takes them over um, individual streets because we have a viaduct similar, I mean, a, 
two bridges that are similar to some of the things that you ran into, and it suddenly got the kids off, off the street. So it's become this huge school walk route that is another thing that we didn't really expect. We talked about it a little bit, but it, it happened to be much more successful than we thought. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bottorf. Yeah, just a quick comment. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was absolutely fabulous. I think both of the presentations today give us great dimension on choices. And what I take away from this is, is what you alluded to is this whole world of what ifs, okay? Because that's where I find us right now. I'm, I'm thankful right now that we're doing a unified quarter study. Absolutely. It's a great uh, I'm probably not so much thankful because we're only analyzing five scenarios. And based on what you said, we should be analyzing 500 scenarios <laughs> because my fear, and I think the fear of everybody in this panel is, is here we are with this opportunity to, to move in a direction when we don't really know what that direction is. We know that we have this great commodity. By far, there's no doubt that the best thing we ever did was buy this this corridor. And even if we had to pay it back or whatever it is, you just don't get the opportunity to own that. So um, whether it's transit, whether it's trail, all these things, you know, I mean, you had a fortunate partner with Google that helped fund a lot of your things. Um, there's no doubt that whatever we do along this corridor, just because it's a scenic corridor, it's going to be enhanced and it's going to be remarkable. And the challenge, I think, for everybody on this board, for this commission, for this county, and i got to take it to that level, is this county is it's a wonderful piece of property and it's the right choice and it's not black and white. It's totally gray and it's, it's um, you know, some things may work, some things may work better, and I hope that somehow there's a compromise that comes with the people in this county so we can work together to do what's best and serves the county across the board. Thank you again, both of you, for your presentations. Yes, thanks. Uh, interesting presentation and really uh, expeditious in terms of how much information and detail you've provided us with. A couple questions that I do have have to do with what was the impact before this was even being studied to be used? I mean, did you have a serious problem like we have in this county in terms of Highway 1? It, was there something identified already that said that we needed to work on this segment and doing... Ab absolutely. We, I mean, the... Seattle area is the fourth most congested in the country, so we're very similar to the, the area down here. And when I, my very first slide, one of the reasons Sound Transit was one of the purchasers of the corridor, Sound Transit actually has a transit easement on the entire 42 miles. So their interest at that time and why they bought it was to actually have some sort of transit alternative along the corridor. So this parallels uh, which, 405, which is very similar to your 101. Um, which is one of the most congested in the state. And so and it goes all the way through the east side, through Bellevue and Redmond and Kirkland, and uh, it's where our sort of tech community is. And we need options. And I think that's the one thing I really appreciated uh, that was said earlier is whether the corridor, how it's used for transit, and it's not just us, it's that whole 42 miles, to create options is absolutely critical. And it's not a solution, but it's one of many. And I think that's, that's, that really struck me. And I think also what he said about if you're fighting, you get nothing is also very true. I mean, we were fighting up and below, and we got nothing, right? But what we did get, and I, I would offer, is we have still preserved all our options, right? So what we did to the corridor got the community to use it, got the community excited, and we could still put in a train, and we could still put in transit. So we have, by trying to say we're not going to do something that precludes <coughs> something else, we've kept all our options open. But yes, it has been very much imagined as a transit corridor from its very inception, as well as a trail. And uh, do you have any other development with your the, the highway that is it with the impact that you've got up there? Uh, because this this seems like it's more of a, a community based, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know how much uh, you know what percentage of the community benefits from it yeah. when everybody's going down to that section instead of the community as a whole needing to get maybe out. I don't know if you're a point to commute to um, versus people leaving that area out. Uh, how how does that? How, how would that differ or how you... Yeah, um, I don't know if you can scroll all the way back to the first map on the... On the or I guess I could, but I don't know if there's a simple way to do that. But um, to answer... So the... I can maybe hit the one or something there. So I'll try to answer that with projections. So the sound transit projections for the ridership, if they put a light rail line from Bellevue, which is our major east side city, to Totem Lake, which is where the small is. So you can see... Uh, where Sound Transit owned is in Central Bellevue, and they have a light rail line they're building across into Seattle. Uh, so, the, yeah, that one right there, please. Thank you. Um, so what they were going to do is build a light rail line through Kirkland up to that our urban center, which was the mall. But their ridership projections for the $1.5 billion was 5,000 people a day. Okay. And that sort of sounds like a lot, maybe, but 
we actually have two buses <coughs> that carry 8,000 people a day that are just, just our little sort of semi-regional buses. And so what we said, why we came up with the bus alternative is we said, wow, that's a whole lot of money and a whole lot of impact <coughs> on the community, and we can maybe actually exceed that ridership if we had this little bus fleet concept. And so we were trying to convince them of that. Um, they are going to be putting light rail on segments of this corridor through Bellevue and on to Redmond. Um, the rest of the corridor is right now has no plans for transit on it. They basically just said, we're not going to talk about it for, for the short term. The total ridership on light rail is helps, but it's not replacing lanes of traffic, you know. So it's, it's the same, some of the same discussion. But um, they're looking at widening 405. They're looking at toll lanes. We already have some toll lanes. They're looking at more of those. So there's all sorts of other conversations going on about what needs to be due to do congestion. But if you could actually have transit on this corridor, you could get off the freeway, run parallel to it, and then get back on in Bellevue and go across to Seattle. So it would help a lot of people quickly. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to just thank both our presenters. It's been really great information. As someone that's worked, worked for years on ac acquiring our corridor and advocating for it, it's taken me aback of the divisiveness of both sides of this conversation. And what your presentations have highlighted <coughs> for me is that we have a lot more in common, both of you, all of you in the audience, those who would want only a trail and those who want a rail and a trail. We have a lot more in common in terms of our goals um, and that's what I would love for everyone to actually focus on as a community so that we can come together as a community and come up with those really good options. And one of those goals is we need to preserve the option of transit along this corridor. It's absolutely bad public policy not to preserve that option. Exactly what that option is and how it rolls out, that's another question and obviously that's the divisive question. Um, but we need to keep that option open. It's just, it's just uh, silly to do otherwise. But thank you again. It was great information. I love trains. Every time I travel, I, tr I we always find my husband makes me ride a train of some kind. <laughs> Even if it's dilapidated, he doesn't care. Um, so I st survived lots of bad trains and good trains. And I love the smart train. It's a great train. Um, and congratulations on what a, what a wonderful thing you've done for your community. I mean, these walking trails, I've been, um, this one's unique. I haven't been on this one. But I've been on many other ones. And they're just wonderful. I mean, they're just used by everyone. And I can just imagine how it would explode our tourism industry and our economy here if we had such an amenity here. So thank you. Mr. Caput. No question. Um, uh, Ms. Triplett, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I chuckled a little bit when you said that the uh, 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 cross Kirkland corridor, you know, everybody talked about. Um, you know, that's like just like our corridor where everybody talks about it. We just don't talk about the same thing. Yes, exactly. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so true. but it is a big piece mm -hmm. of conversation. You know, um, j just to get uh, clarity, the, the, the rail line that went through Kirkland w was an unused yeah. uh, corridor. There wasn't any freight on it or anything like that. Right. So the, the Burlington Northern had abandoned the line, and then we rail banked it. Okay. So the northern piece in Snohomish County does still have active freight, <laughs> and actually that is also in public ownership, but it does have a freight line on that section. But the rest of it did not. And in looking at the maps, it seems like the surrounding area is all urban. There's no ag. There is no ag, right? Yeah. So, uh, so th there's, there's slight differences uh, uh, to what we have Absolutely. here. Yeah. You mentioned that um, I'm not going to get the name of the, the the Sam Trans or whatever it was called. Um, uh, you said there was a measure they wanted to put light rail. Yeah. Um, your community wasn't didn't want to do it, um, and so they did a funding measure, and th then you're not getting money from that measure. Or how does that work? That's correct. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That could be its own five-hour presentation. Yeah, so the short version is the three county measures, so it was King, Pearson, Snohomish counties, which is basically our major metropolitan area in Washington. Uh, it was primarily sales tax, but also a property tax measure. And so what the three county board, the Sound Transit board, was doing is trying to figure out what would they build and where would they build it. And because Sound Transit had a transit easement that they'd already purchased on this corridor, they did planning for different scenarios on the corridor. And so one was... They already are currently building light rail from Seattle to Bellevue, and it was to extend that light rail line up through Bellevue, up through Kirkland, up to our urban center, our Totemic Urban Center, um, which is where we want that kind of transit. Um, what happened, though, was, in my opinion, in my council's opinion, 
The engineers stopped listening, and when we kept saying we want transit, but we don't think light rail is the right transit, they couldn't hear anything but you don't want light rail, you don't want transit. And then our community was saying, we don't want buses or trains. <laughs> we don't want anything. So it, it became really challenging really quickly. Uh, but as I said, in the end, our council stuck to, we do want transit, we just don't want this train, and for the reasons that I talked about. We just felt that the the impact would be too severe for the ridership numbers, but we really felt like we gave them a viable alternative. We spent about $250,000 developing this bus rapid transit plan, which we handed to them and said, we actually think you could do this. And uh, they just wouldn't. And so we're regretting that, but. So it, in, in a future idea of, of putting transit on the line, how will you pay for it? Mm -hmm. So the Sound Transit does a ballot measure about every 10 years. So we joke about, okay, so when ST4 comes, we'll talk about it. Um, but we also have a, similar to you, we have a King County transit system that's just King County, which is our, our bus system. And they frequently go out more often than that with ballot measures. And we're now engaging them on the idea of maybe we just view this as a, a sub-regional busway and do a lot of the things that I talked to you guys about is, hey, let's pilot this idea of a Proterra electric bus or a driver's electric bus or something over on this side. Uh, so we're not giving up, but the transit people are not us. So we can't do a lot on our own. We could, sure. build, we could build a platform, we could build a road, but we can't actually provide any of the service under our, under our laws. So we need some other partner to come along with us. So we're having those conversations right now. And given that your community is sort of unclear whether they want transit, even though your leadership does, does that set up a, uh, you know, a, a challenge? It's interesting. Like anything else, when you – we did a lot of sort of demographic work with all of the hearings and stuff, like where are people and what are they saying? And it won't shock anyone that the most adamant opposition was all within about 100 feet of the corridor, right? Some beautiful high-end homes, a lot of people with significant means. <laughs> uh, as you get farther out, people want the transit. So what, what I think will happen, because it happened after we started having the listening sessions at the end, is the rest of the community that's not right on the corridor wants to be able to catch a bus on that corridor. The people who live right on the corridor don't want a bus. So I think a future council, whenever that may be, will have majority support, but they will definitely have very active, vocal, well-funded opposition, and they'll just have to make a choice. Sure. Um, and if it's this current council, the, they've already made that choice, what a future council will do, I don't know. Well, there's probably lots more questions. Yeah. I want to respect everyone's time. Uh, I really appreciate the presentation. I think it was very, very helpful. Both these presentations were incredibly helpful for us as we think about the big issues uh, here in Santa Cruz County. I do want to get a, a sign of how many people would like to make brief comments or questions um, now. Raise them high. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the same rule in place. We'll do uh, one minute. Um, if you have questions or comments, uh, please come forward. While you're coming forward, uh, I also just want to express my appreciation to Robert Stevens, who uh, connected me uh, with Kirk um, and encouraged uh, us to have this conversation. I appreciate uh, his doggedness and wanted to make sure it happened because it was a very useful presentation. So thank you, Robert. And Lee Sokolow. Um, I, I just want to point, point out the obvious. Uh, the Kirkland Trail is 10 feet wide, and our trail is planned for 8 to 16 feet wide, if I'm correct. Okay. So this 10-foot wide trail seems to be a tremendous success. If we end up with the 12-foot, 8-foot in the constricted areas wide trail, it could be a tremendous success, even though it's got a train next to it or a bus or whatever or pod cars, something. Um, and the other thing I want to point out is that our unified corridor investment study is not looking at one of the alternatives presented here, which is the elevated pod car, cable car idea, fixed rail elevated. I think that's a mistake. It should have been put in there just because it's feasible and, and maybe it's a way of using the narrow sections without taking up much footprint. Thank you. I'm not a big advocate for it, but I think it should have been included in the study. Good afternoon. Hello, uh, Peter Stanger. Um, I just want to say I, I thought all the speakers, or both speakers, were fantastic and enlightening. And uh, personally, I think you know that I'm into bicycling, but on the other hand, uh, I also am into transit. I take a lot of trains as well in Spain and in uh, 
here in the United States and uh, Caltrain. And uh, I just thought we do need a transit solution as well. And I am very encouraged from what I heard today. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Brett Garrett. Um, thank you to both speakers. Wonderful material. Um, in particular, I want to thank Mr. Triplett for mentioning the concept of fixed guideway technology and overhead um, um, transit. I'm a, I'm a big fan of personal rapid transit, and in particular, the, the SkyTran approach. Um, there's some new information about SkyTran. They're based in Mountain View. Um, also, the Futron, which is Ron Swenson, our local resident, is very involved with Futron, and they're doing something very similar to SkyTran. Um, I, I just, I, I want to second uh, Mr. Botarf's comment about that uh, we need some more scenarios in the Unified Corridor study, um, including the fixed guideway transit, and I, I, and I think that's also part of the answer to fare box recovery. I mean, looking at, at the PRT system in Morgantown, Pennsylvania, the fare's only 50 cents and it pays about half the operating expense. Thank you. Thank you. Robert Stevens here. I just wanted to make a couple of quick comments and maybe a question. First of all, pointing out the cost of their trail was very minimal. The plan with buses is that buses and bikes can share that corridor, or they might be separated. But the beauty now is you get to use the corridor. When you think of how many years their community is enjoying that corridor, and we might not have that, uh, rail banking does work. It's happening all over the country. And this idea that there will be lawsuits to like the 20. 200 million up in Seattle is really not true if you ask Kurt. He can explain you all the details on that. So for me, the obvious way forward is rail banking, keeping all our options open and letting people use the corridor now because it's an asset for our whole community. So thank you, John, for putting all this together. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Sylvia Morales, and I am a Watsonville resident. Um, thank you so much for bringing this to our community. It's really been eye-opening for me. I've been paying attention to this debate for uh, some months now and trying to get up to speed on all the different components and all the different parties and who's interested in this and that and the other. And um, I commute uh, to Pacific Collegiate every day. I take my children there that's o over on the west side. And uh, the possibility of being able to possibly take my kids somewhere closer <laughs> so they can get themselves there and back is really exciting for me as a parent, since I will be there uh, going back and forth uh, for about eight more years because I have three children. And it costs me about uh, $100 a, a week on gas, which is $400 a month. That's just the expense of gas, but also my time, which is also valuable. Um, and also, just for them to be able to have access to a beautiful um, you know, pathway to get back and forth, and also t for the opportunity for other youth to be able to use that pathway from this community also is also very exciting. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello, Felipe Hernandez again. Um, I like the way they did the uh, on the previous presentation when they did the uh, sort of lessons learned. So if you could do it over, what w would you do different? Would you remove the tracks? And you mentioned that you're doing two lanes on the trail or trying to do two, two lanes on the trail. Um, how wide is your trail? And our plan is for 10 to 16 foot wide. Do you believe that's a safe accommodation for a trail? And the third question is how many bicyclists and pedestrians are using the trail daily? Do you know the split of commuters and recreational riders? Uh, sort of the line of question that came over here, how many cars do you think are taken off the highway by, with a trail? Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody after Ms. McNulty? You will be the final comment on this. Okay, um, I would like to echo, echo others' um, gratitude for having this presentation today. It would it'd be terrific to see these happening in a bigger, more community-centered forum. I know it's difficult for people to make it here in the morning, and I think these were two valuable speeches here today, so the more we could have this type of thing um, in the evening, it would be wonderful. And also, um, 
I hope that these speakers are coming in time to actually have some impact on the study that is going on right now. Um, it was tremendous to see this idea that, you know, we have one community that has installed a trail. They're holding on to the idea of transit maybe for the future. They're not worrying about how much money they may or may not have lost in grant funding because the community is benefiting it from it right now and they're seeing unexpected benefits. So it's 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 interesting to think outside of the box and think in terms of the technology that's developing as we speak and even our unified corridor study things have changed dramatically since that was put together. So thank you. Thank so you. You know there was an earlier presentation at the Simpkins Swim Center by one of the presence presenters today at night. Yeah, no, correct. No, but that I, was by I, Fort and not the RTC, and it's no. not the same as bringing the community no. together to hear both sides. Thank That's you. A, we're not going to get or into a dialogue that. here. Um, the uh, we these uh, talks that are part of the Innovators series are available on or will be the ones that had already taken place is available on our website, and these will be available on our website. And I encourage. Uh, whatever side of the discussion you want to be on, uh, to share these through social media, websites, newsletters, um, so people can hear them. Because that is the interest of us, is to educate the community as broadly as, as possible. Us as policymakers, but the community in general. Um, so we're not going to take time to answer all the questions. We will work with Mr. Mansourin and Mr. Triplett about uh, getting some question answered and figure out a way to do that. Uh, because of the hour, I'm, I'm, I'm sensitive uh, to the timing about that. Did you want to say any final words, uh, Mr. Dondero? Um, we do have a closed session item that I, I need uh, the uh, commission to stay for. And if there's anyone who would like to address us about that, uh, that, com that item, please come forward. Seeing none, I just want to again express the appreciation, appreciation of the entire Regional Transportation Commission uh, to Mr. Triplett, and Mr. Mansourin, uh, Ms. Fudge, uh, for being here, for helping educate us uh, and the community uh, about the different strategies that you use to come up with very good, innovative solutions to moving people around in your community. It really helps us out. Thank you very much. <laughs>